Hi, welcome back to the course Data Mining with Weka. I'm uh, Ian up here in New Zealand and this is uh, lesson 1.2. Remember there are five classes in this course and each class consists of about six lessons. So this is the second lesson of the first class and we're going to explore the Explorer, the Weka Explorer interface. Actually, first we're going to download the Weka system. This is something you're going to have to do on your computer. We're going to download it from this URL. So without delay, let's go straight there. Here we are. This is www.cs.waikato.ac.nz slash ml slash Weka. And I'm going to go, you can read about Weka here, but I'm going to go straight to the download button and download and install Weka on my computer. I'm running on a Windows machine here, but there are versions down at the bottom you can see for Mac OS and Linux and so on. So you need to download the appropriate version for your machine. We want Weka 3.6.10. That's the latest uh, version of Weka. Uh, so I'm going to uh, download a self-extracting executable without the Java Virtual Machine. I already have the Java Virtual Machine on my computer. So uh, I'm going to click here, but you're going to need to do whatever, whatever is appropriate for your computer. Uh, let's just save it here. So while it's done loading, just uh, let's have a word about the pronunciation of the word Weka. It's called Weka. We don't like calling it the weaker system. It's not weaker, it's Weka pronounced to rhyme with Mecca. That's the name of the bird. That's the name of our software, Weka. So I think now it might have downloaded. I'm going to uh, open it. Yes, I'm happy with this. Um, this is a setup wizard, which is a standard kind of setup wizard. We're installing Weka 3.6.10. I'm just going to keep clicking next here. Yes, I'm happy with this GNU uh, public license. I'm going to have a full install. I'm going to install it in the default place. Just need to remember the name of this place because we're going to need to visit there in a moment. I'm going to install the whole thing. It's going to take a couple of minutes. I'm just off for a cup of coffee. I'll be back in a second. Okay, now it's installed. Let's just carry on here. I want to click finish, but actually I'm not going to start Weka. I'm going to un uncheck that and click finish because there are a couple of things I want to do first. Uh, so let's go and see where Weka is. It's on uh, my computer uh, in program files and uh, it should be down here. Yes, Weka 3.6. I'm going to just create a shortcut to that because we're going to be using it a lot in this course. Create shortcuts. It's going to put it on the desktop. That's fine. I'll just stick it there. And then I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to go inside this folder. I'm going to look at the data file. Where is data? The data folder. This contains a bunch of data sets we're going to be using. And I'm going to take this folder and copy it and put it somewhere convenient. So let's cut that and I'm going to just put it in my documents folder. There it is. I'm just going to rename it, I think. I'll rename it Weka Datasets. Cool. So I'm all, all set. There it is. I finished installing Weka. I don't think I need this anymore. And I don't think I need this anymore. I've got my shortcut to Weka here. Ah, I made my shortcut to the wrong place. I meant to make the shortcut to uh, this here. Let me just make a shortcut here. Weka, create shortcut, put it on the desktop. That's the one I want. So now when I click here, it will open Weka. Okay. Back to the slide. Uh, so there are four interfaces in Weka. The Explorer, that's the one we're going to be using throughout this course. We're just using the Explorer. Uh, but also there's the Experimenter for performance comparisons, uh, large-scale performance comparisons for different machine learning methods on different data sets. 
there's a knowledge flow interface, which is a graphical interface to the Weka tools, and there's a command line interface. But we're just going to use the Explorer, so let's get on with it. Here's the Explorer, and across the top, there are uh, five uh, panels, the pre-process panel, the classify panel, these are actually grayed out because I haven't opened a file yet. Uh, there's the classify panel, which where you kind of build classifiers for uh, data sets. Clustering, another uh, procedure that uh, Weka is good at, although we won't be talking about clustering in this course. Association rules, attribute selection, and visualization. In this course, we're going to be using mainly the pre-process panel to open files and so on, the classify panel to experiment with classifiers, and the visualize panel to visualize our data sets. So I'm going to open a data set. Uh, the data set I'm going to open is called the weather data. It's a little toy data set that we'll be seeing a lot of in this course. Uh, it's about uh, 14 instances, 14 days. And for each of these days, we've got recorded five, the values of five attributes. Four to do with the weather, outlook, temperature, humidity, windy. And the fifth play is whether or not we're going to play a particular unspecified game. So actually, what we're going to be doing is predicting the play attribute from the other attributes. But let's not worry about that at the moment. Let's just open the data set and take a look at it in Weka. So uh, here's my uh, documents. Here's the Weka data sets. This is what I copied. And I'm going to open weather.nominal.arf. All uh, Weka uh, data files are called arf files. We'll talk about that later on. So this is the weather data. And just ignore these colorful bars down here at the moment. There are 14 instances. Those correspond to the 14 days that we saw in the data set on the slide. And for each day, we've got five attributes, outlook, temperature, humidity, windy, and play. So if we select one of these attributes, outlook is selected at the moment, we can see the values. The values for the outlook attribute were sunny, overcast, and rainy. And these are the number of times they appear in the data set. Five sunny days, four overcast days, five rainy days for a total of 14 uh, days, 14 instances. If we look at the temperature attributes, we've got hot, mild, and cool are the possible values, and these are the number of times they appear in the data set. Let's go to the play attribute. There are two values for play, yes or no. And now let's look at these two bars here. Uh, blue corresponds to yes, and uh, red corresponds to no. And if you look at one of the other attributes, like Outlook, you can see that when the Outlook is sunny, this is like a histogram, there are three no instances and two yes instances. When the Outlook is overcast, there are four yes instances and zero no instances. So these are like a kind of histogram of the attribute values in terms of the attribute we're trying to predict. It makes it kind of useful to click around and visualize your data. So we've opened the weather data, weather.nominal.arf, and uh, we've looked at the uh, attribute values and uh, the attributes uh, in Weka. Uh, one more thing I want to do before we summarize here, I want to go to the edit panel. If I go to edit panel, I see the uh, data in the form that it was on the slide, with the 14 days down here and the five attributes across here. So this is another kind of view of the data. And I can actually change this data set. So if I click here, I can change this no to yes. Or if I click here, I can change on this day the uh, outlook from rainy to sunny. If only it were so easy in real life to change a day from rainy to sunny. And then I can click uh, OK, and now we've got this edited data set, which we could save if we like. We haven't saved any of this. The data set on the disk is still the same as it was. I'm not going to save it, and I don't think you should save it, because we're going to be using this data set uh, quite a bit in this course. OK, so this is what we've done in this lesson. We've installed Weka. We've got the data sets. 
We've opened the Explorer. We've uh, looked at a data set, the weather.nominal.arf data set. We've looked at the attributes and their values. We've edited the data set and we didn't save it. You can read more about this in the course text. Uh, section 1.2 talks about the weather data, and chapter 10 is a little introduction to the uh, Weka uh, system. And now you should go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back for another five minutes in New Zealand with data mining with Weka. This is lesson 1.3, and we're going to look at exploring data sets in this uh, lesson. Uh, so we looked at uh, this data file in the last lesson. It's the weather data, a toy data set, of course. It has 14, it's about 14 days or instances, and each instance, each day is described by five attributes, four to do with the weather, and the last attribute, uh, the, which we call the class value, the thing that we're trying to predict whether or not to play this unspecified game. So uh, let's just, uh, this is called a classification problem. We're trying to predict the class value. Let's open up Weka. It's here on my desktop. And I'm going to go into the Explorer. We always use the Explorer. I'm going to open the file. And I put uh, the data sets in my documents folder so I can see them here. I'll just open the Weka data sets and the nominal weather data. So there's the weather data in Weka. And as we saw last time, uh, you can see uh, the size of the data set, the number of instances, 14. You can see the attributes. You can click any of these attributes and get the values for that, those attributes uh, up here in this panel. And uh, you also get at the bottom a, a histogram of the attribute values uh, with respect to the different class values. The different class values are blue for uh, yes, play, and red for no, don't play. By default, the last attribute in Weka is always the class value. You can change this if you like. If you change it here, you can uh, decide to predict a different uh, one other than the last, the last attribute. So that's the weather data set, and we've already explored that. As I said, it's a classification problem, sometimes called a supervised learning problem. Supervised because you get to know the class values of the training instances. So we take as input a data set of classified examples. These uh, examples are independent examples with a class value attached. And the idea is to produce automatically a model, that, some kind of model, that can classify new examples. That's the classification problem. And uh, here's uh, what the examples look like. This is the, uh, an instance with uh, the different attribute values, a fixed set of features, and then we add to that the class to get the classified example. That's what we have to have in our training data set. These uh, attributes or features can be discrete or continuous. What we looked at uh, in the weather data were discrete, or we call them nominal attribute values, where they belong to a certain fixed set. Or they can be numeric or uh, continuous values. And also the class can be discrete or continuous. We're looking at a discrete class, yes or no, in the case of the weather data. But another kind of machine learning problem would involve continuous classes, where you're trying to predict a number. That's called a regression problem in the trade. So I'm going to uh, have a look at a uh, similar uh, data set to the weather data set, the numeric weather data set. Let me just open that in Weka, weather.numeric.arf. And here it is. It's very similar, almost identical, in fact, for 14 instances, five attributes, the same attributes. But uh, maybe I should just look at this data set in the edit panel. You can see here that two of the attributes, temperature and humidity, are numeric attributes, whereas previously they were nominal attributes. So here there are numbers. And uh, what we see when we look at the attribute values for outlook, just as before, we have sunny, overcast, and rainy. For temperature, though, we can't enumerate the values. There's too many numbers to enumerate. Uh, we've got the minimum and maximum value and the mean and standard deviation. So that's what Weka gives you 
for the numeric values. Okay, I'm going to look at a different data set. I'm going to look at the glass data set, which is a rather more extensive data set. It's a real world data set, not a terribly big one. But, uh, let's open it. So here we've got 214 instances and 10 attributes. And here are the 10 attributes. It's not clear at the moment what they are. Let's look at the class by default, the last uh, attribute shown. And uh, there are seven values for the class, and uh, the, the labels of these values give you some indication of what this data set is about. We've got uh, headlamps, tableware, starting from the bottom, containers, and then we've got building windows and vehicle windows, float and non-float. You may not know this, but there are different ways of making glass, and floating, the floating process is a way of making glass. So these are seven different kinds of glass. And what are the attribute values? Well, I don't know what you remember about uh, physics, but uh, and I guess it doesn't matter if you don't remember, but RI stands for the refractive index. And it's always a good idea to check for reasonableness when you're looking at uh, data sets. It's really important to get down and dirty with your data. So here we're looking at the values of the refractive index, a minimum of 1.511, the maximum of 1.534. It's good to think about whether these are reasonable values for a refractive index. If you go to the web and have a look around, you'll find that these are good values for the refractive index. Na, well, if you did chemistry, you'll recognize Na as sodium. Uh, and uh, here it looks like these are percentages, the uh, different percentages of sodium, magnesium, Mg, and so on. We would expect uh, Si, silicon. Where's silicon? Yeah, that makes up the majority of glass. It varies between 69.8% and 75.4%. So these are percentages of different uh, elements in the glass. We can confirm our guesses here by looking at the data file itself. Let me just find the glass data. It's in Weka datasets. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to open that. It's in Weka datasets and it's glass.arf. This is the ARF file format. And it starts with a bunch of comments about the glass database. These lines beginning with percent are comments. And you can read about this. We don't have time to read it now. But uh, you can see about the attributes. And it does say that the attributes are refractive index and sodium, magnesium, and so on. And the type of glass, just like I said, is about windows and uh, containers and tableware and so on. We can get down to the end of the comments. And uh, here we have stuff for Weka. This is the ARF format. The relation has a name. You'll see it printed in the interface when you look. And then uh, the attributes are defined. They're real valued attributes, numeric attributes. Uh, the type attribute is nominal, and the different values of type are, are enumerated here in quotes. So that defines the relation and the attributes. And then we have an at data line, and following that in the R format are simply the instances, one after the other, with the attribute values all on one line, ending with the class by default. So this is the class value for the first instance. And I think there are 214 instances here. There's the, uh, there's the last one. So that's the ARF format. It's a very simple textual file format. And now we've confirmed our guesses about these being percentages, these numbers being percentages of different elements. We can we just move that out of the way. We can think about this some more. So it's important then that these numbers are reasonable. If they went negative, for example, if there's a negative value in there, that would indicate some kind of corrupted value. You can't have a negative percentage. We're expecting uh, silicon to be the majority component. We're expecting the refractive index to be in this kind of range. So it's always a good idea when you get a data set to just kind of click around in the Weka interface and make sure things look real, rather small amounts of aluminum in, uh, in, in glass. I guess that's not surprising. I don't know very much about glass myself. So we're just kind of checking for reasonableness here. Very good thing to do. OK. That's it then. We've uh, looked in this lesson at the classification problem. 
We've looked at the uh, nominal weather data and the numeric weather data. We've talked about nominal versus numeric attributes, and we've talked about the ARF file format. Looked at the glass dot ARF data set, and I've talked about sanity checking of attributes and the importance of getting down and dirty with your data. If you like some further background on this, you could go with section 11.1 of the text and read about preparing the data and loading the data into the Explorer. Whether or not you do that, please go and have a look at the activity associated with this lesson. We'll see you soon. Bye. A bit about flowers if you did the activity associated with the last lesson. Now we're going to actually build a classifier, lesson 1.4, building a classifier. We're going to use a system called J48. I'll tell you why it's called J48 uh, in a minute to analyze the glass data set that uh, we looked at in the last lesson. So I've got the glass data set open here. And I'm going to go to the classify panel. And I choose a classifier here. By, I'm going to just close this. There's different kinds of classifiers. Weka has Bayes classifiers, function classifiers, lazy classifiers, meta classifiers, and so on. We're going to use a tree classifier. J48 is a tree classifier. So I'm going to open trees and click J48. Here it is, the J48 classifier. Well, let's run it. If we just press start, we've got the data set, we've got the classifier, and lo and behold, it's done it. It's a bit of an anticlimax, really. Weka makes things very easy for you to do. The problem is understanding what it is that you've done. So let's take a look. Uh, here there's uh, some information about the data sets, so the glass data set, the number of instances and attributes. Uh, and then it's printed out. This is actually a representation of a tree here. Uh, we'll look at these trees later on. But just note that this tree has got uh, 30 leaves and 59 nodes altogether. And the overall accuracy is 66.8%. So it's done pretty well, I guess. Down at the bottom here, we've got a confusion matrix. Remember, there were about seven different kinds of glass. So this is building windows made of float glass. And uh, you can see that 50 of these have been classified as A, which is correctly classified. 15 of them have been classified as B, which is building windows non-float glass. So those are errors. And three have been classified as C, and so on. So this is a confusion matrix. The, most of the weight is down the main diagonal, which we like to see, because that indicates correct classifications. Everything off the main diagonal indicates a misclassification. OK, so that's the uh, confusion matrix. Now let's go on and investigate this a bit further. We're going to open a configuration panel for J48. Remember, I chose it by clicking the Choose button. Now if I click it here, I get a configuration panel. So I'm, I clicked J48 uh, in this menu, and I get a configuration panel, which gives a bunch of parameters. Uh, I'm not going to really uh, talk about these parameters. Let's just look at one of them, the unpruned parameter, which by default is false. So what we've just done is to build a pruned tree, because unpruned is false. So we can change this to build, make it true, and build an unpruned tree. We've changed the configuration. We can run it again. And it just ran again. And now we have a different result, or a potentially different result. So let's just have a look. We've got 67% uh, correct classification. What do we have before? These are the runs. This is the previous run. And there we had 68%. Now in this run that we've just done with the unpruned tree, we got 67% uh, accuracy. And the, the tree is the same size. So uh, that's one option. I'm just going to look at another option, and then we'll look at some trees. So I'm going to click the configuration panel again, and I'm going to look at uh, the, I'm going to change the, where is it now? The min num obj parameter. What is that? That is the minimum number of instances per leaf. I'm going to change that from 2 up to 15. 
to have larger leaves. These are the leaves of the tree here. And these numbers in brackets are the number of instances that get to that leaf. When there's two numbers, this means that one incorrectly classified instance got to this leaf and five correctly classified instances got there. So you can see that all these leaves are pretty small, with just sometimes two or three, or oh, here's one with 31 uh, instances. So we've constrained now this number. The tree is going to be generated, and this number is always going to be 15 or more. So let's run it again. Now we've got a worse result, 61% correct classification, but a much smaller tree with uh, only uh, six leaves. Is that a six? No, eight leaves, I'm sorry. So now we can visualize this tree. If I right click on the line, these are the lines that describe each of the runs that we've done. This is the third run. If I right click on that, I get a little menu and I can visualize the tree. So uh, there it is. If I uh, right click on empty space, I can fit this to the screen. So this is the decision tree. This says, first of all, look at the barium content. Uh, if it's large, then it must be headlamps. If it's small, then magnesium. If that's small, then let's look at uh, potassium. And if that's small, then we've got tableware. That sounds like a pretty good thing to me. I don't want too much potassium in my tableware. So this is a visualization of the tree, and it's the same tree that you can see by looking here. This is just the same kind of, a different representation of the tr same tree. Just show you one more thing about this configuration panel, which is the More button. This gives you more information about the classifier, about uh, J48. And uh, it's always useful to look at that to see where these classifiers have come from. In this case, let me explain why it's called J48. It's based on uh, a famous system called C4.5, which was described in a book. The book is referenced here. In fact, I think I've got it on my shelf. This book here, C4.5, Programs for Machine Learning, by an Australian computer scientist called uh, Ross Quinlan. Uh, he started out with a system called ID3, I think. That might have been in his PhD thesis. And then C4.5 became quite famous. This kind of morphed into, through various versions, into C4.5. It became famous, the book came out, and so on. He continued to work on this system, went up to C4.8, uh, and then it went commercial. Up until then, these were all open source systems. So when we built Weka, we took uh, the latest version of uh, C4.5, C4 which was C4.8, and we rewrote it. Work is written in Java, so we called it J48. Maybe it's not a very good name, but that's the name that's stuck. So there's a little bit of history for you. So we've talked about classifiers in Weka. I've showed you where you find the classifiers. We classified the glass data set. We looked at how to interpret the output from J48, in particular the confusion matrix. We looked at the configuration panel for J48. We looked at a couple of options, pruned versus unpruned trees, and the option to avoid small leaves. And I told you how J48 really corresponds to the machine learning system that most people know as C4.5. C4.5 and C4.8 were really pretty similar. So we just talk about uh, J48 as though it's synonymous with C4.5. You can uh, read about this in the book, section 11.1, about building a decision tree and examining the output. And uh, now, off you go and do your activity associated with, with this lesson. See you again soon. Hello. In the last lesson, we looked at uh, using a classifier in Weka J48. And in this lesson, we're going to look at another of Weka's uh, principal features, filters. One of the main messages of this course is that it's really important when you're doing data mining to get close to your data and to think about pre-processing it or filtering it in some way before applying a classifier. So, I'm going to uh, start out by using a filter to remove an attribute from the weather data. Let me uh, start up the Weka Explorer and open the weather data. That's the one. And I'm going to remove, let's remove the humidity attribute. That's attribute number three. 
So I can uh, look at filters, just like we chose classifier using this choose button on the classify panel. We choose filters by using the choose button here. And uh, there are a lot of different filters, all filter and multi-filter are ways of combining filters. We've got supervised and unsupervised filters. Supervised filters are ones that use the class value for their operation. Um, they're not so common as unsupervised filters, which don't use the class value. And there's attribute filters and instance filters. We want to remove an attribute, so we're looking for an attribute filter. And there's so many filters in Weka that you just have to learn to kind of look around and find what you want. So I'm going to look for removing an attribute. And uh, here we go, remove. Now, as before, when we configured the J48 classifier, we clicked here. So I'm going to click here and we can configure the filter. This is a filter that removes a range of attributes from the data set. Well, I can specify a range of attributes here. Uh, I just want to remove one. I think it was attribute number three we were going to remove. Uh, I could invert the selection, remove all the other attributes and leave three. Uh, but I'm just going to leave it like that. Click OK and watch humidity go when we apply the filter. Nothing happens until you apply the filter and I've just applied it, and here we are, the humidity attribute has been removed. Luckily I can undo the effect of that and put it back by pressing the undo button. So that's how to remove an attribute. Actually the bad news is there's a much easier way to remove an attribute. You don't need to use a filter at all. If you just want to remove an attribute, you can select it here and click the remove button at the bottom. It does the same job. Sorry about that. But anyway, filters are really useful and can do much more complex things than that. So let's, for example, imagine removing not an attribute, but let's remove all instances that where humidity has got the value high. That is, attribute number three has got its first value. That's going to remove seven instances from the data set. There's 14 instances altogether, so we're going to get left with a reduced data set of seven attributes. Okay, let's look for a filter to do that. Now, we want to remove instances. So it's going to be an instance filter. And I just have to look down here and see if there's anything suitable. How about remove with values? The remove with values filter. I can uh, click that to configure it. And uh, I can click more to see what it does. And here it says, it uh, filters instances according to the value of an attribute, which is exactly what we want. So we're going to set the attribute index. We want the third attribute, humidity, and the first value. We can remove a number of different values. We'll just remove the first value. Now we've configured that. Nothing happens until we apply the filter. And watch what happens when we apply it. We still have the humidity attribute there, but we have zero elements with high humidity. In fact, the data set has been reduced to only seven instances. Recall that when you do anything here, you can save the results. So we could save that reduced data set if we want to, but I don't want to do that now. So I'm going to undo this. Okay, we remove the instances where humidity is high. We have to think about when we're looking for filters, whether we want a supervised or an unsupervised filter, whether we want an attribute filter or an instance filter, and uh, then just kind of use your common sense to look down the list of filters to see which one you want. Sometimes when you filter data, you get much better classification. Here's a really simple example. I'm going to open the glass data set that we saw before. Here's the glass data set. And I'm going to use uh, J48, which we did before. It's a tree classifier. Uh, where is it? It's J48. I'm going to start that. And I get an accuracy of 66, a little bit over 66%. Okay, now let's remove FE, that is iron. Remove this attribute. And we get a smaller data set. Go and run. J48 again, and now we get an accuracy of 67 and a little bit. So we've improved the accuracy a little bit by removing that attribute. Sometimes the effect is pretty dramatic. Actually, in this data set, I'm going to remove everything except for the refractive index and Mg, magnesium. I'm going to remove all of these attributes. 
left with a much smaller data set with two attributes. Apply J48 again. And now I've got an even better result, 68, nearly 69% accuracy. And uh, I can uh, visualize that tree, of course, remember, by right-clicking here and visualizing the tree and have a look and see what it means. It's much easier to visualize the tr trees when they're smaller, so this is a good one to look at and consider what the structure of this decision is. So that's it for now. We've looked at filters in Weka. We've looked at supervised versus unsupervised, attribute versus instance filters. To find the right filter, you need to look. They can be very powerful, and judiciously removing attributes can both improve performance and increase comprehensibility. If you like, for some background reading on this, go to the textbook and have a look at section 11.2 on loading and filtering files, and uh, then go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Bye for now. Hi. I went to see that movie, The Great Gatsby, last night. I thought it was really good. I hope you don't mind if I uh, finish off my martini. Anyway, one of the constantly recurring themes in this course is the necessity to get close to your data. Look at it in every possible way. So this, in this last lesson of the first class, we're going to look at visualizing your data. This is what we're going to do. We're going to use the Visualize panel. I'm going to open the IRIS data set. You came across the IRIS data set in one of the activities, I think. Uh, I'm using it because it has numeric attributes, four numeric attributes, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and the class are the three kinds of iris flower, iris setosa, iris verticolor, and iris virginica. So let's go to the visualize panel and visualize this data. There's a matrix of two-dimensional plots here, a five by five matrix of plots. I can scroll up here, and uh, if I can select one of these plots, I'm going to be looking at a plot of uh, sepal width on the x-axis and uh, petal width on the y-axis. And that's a plot of the data. The uh, colors correspond to the three classes. I could actually change the colors if I don't like those. I could select another color, but I'm going to leave them the way they are. I can look at individual data points by clicking on them. And this is talking about instance, uh, instance number 86, sepal length of 6, sepal width of 3.4, and so on. And that's a versicolor, uh, which is why the spot is colored red. So we can look at individual instances. We can change the X and Y axis by changing on the menus here, or better still, if we click on this little uh, set of bars here, these represent the attributes. I'm going to click on this, and the X axis will change to sepal length. Here the X axis is sepal width. Here the X axis is petal length, and so on. If I uh, right click, then it'll change the Y axis to sepal length. That's the y-axis is sepal length. So I can quickly browse around these different, uh, these different plots. Uh, there's a slider, the jitter slider. So sometimes points sit right, right on top of each other. And jitter just adds a little bit of randomness to the x and the y-axis. With a little bit of jitter on here, the darker spots represent multiple instances. So if I click on one of those, like this one here, I can see that that point represents three separate instances, all of class Iris Setosa, and they all have the same value of petal length and sepal width, both of which are being plotted on this graph. The sepal width and petal length are 3.0 and 1.4 for each of the three instances. Uh, so uh, if I click another one here, let's see, this one here are two with uh, very similar sepal length and petal lengths uh, on both of the class Versicolor. So the jitter slider helps you distinguish between points that are in fact very close together. Another thing we can do is to select bits of this data set. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to choose select rectangle here. So if I draw out a rectangle now, I can select these points. And if I were to submit this rectangle, then 
all other points would be excluded and just these points would appear on the graph with the axis rescaled appropriately. So here we go, I've selected that, uh, I've submitted that rectangle and you can see that there's just the red points and green points there. I could uh, save that if I wanted as a different data set or I can uh, reset it and maybe try another kind of selection like this where I'm going to have some blue points, some red and some green points and see what that looks like. So this might be a way of cleaning up outliers in your data by selecting rectangles and saving the new data set. Okay, that's visualizing the data set itself. What about visualizing the result of a classifier? Let's get rid of this visualize panel and back to the pre-process panel. I'm going to use a classifier. I'm going to use, uh, guess what, J48. Let's find it under trees. J48. I'm going to run it. Now if I right click on this uh, entry here uh, in the log area, I can view the classifier errors. So here we've got the class plotted against the predicted class and the square boxes represent errors. So if I click on one of these, I can of course change the different axes if I want. I can change the x-axis and the y-axis. Uh, but I'm going to go back to class and predicted class here. And uh, if I click on one of these boxes, I can see where the errors are. So there are two instances where the predicted class is Verticolor and the actual class is Virginica. We can see these in the confusion matrix. The actual class is Virginica, that's here, and the predicted class is Verticolor, that's B. So these two, this uh, two entry in the confusion matrix uh, is represented by these two instances here. If I look at another point, say this one, here I've got one instance, which uh, is in fact a Satosa predicted to be a Versicolor. So that is this Satosa predicted to be a Versicolor. Now I can kind of look at this plot and uh, find out where the misclassifications are actually occurring, the errors in the confusion matrix. Okay, so get down and dirty with your data, visualize it. You can do all sorts of things. You can clean it up, detect outliers. You can look at classification errors. For example, there's a filter that allows you to add a classification. The classifications as a new attribute. Let's just go and have a look at that. I'm going to go and find a filter. You know, we're going to add an attribute. It's supervised because it uses a class. Add an attribute. I'm going to add classification. And here I get to choose in the configuration panel, a machine learning scheme. I'm going to choose. Uh, I'm going to choose J48, of course, and I'm going to output the classification. Make that true. That's configured it, and I'm going to apply it, and it'll add a new attribute. There, it's done it, and this attribute is the classification according to J48. Weka is very powerful. You can do all sorts of things with classifiers and filters. Okay, that's the end of the first class. Uh, there's a section in the book on visualization. Uh, please go and uh, do the activity associated with this class and uh, I'll see you in the next class. Hi, welcome back to Data Mining with Weka. This is class two. In the first class we downloaded Weka and we looked around the Explorer and a few data sets. We used a classifier, the J48 classifier. We used a filter to remove attributes and to remove some instances. Uh, we visualized some data. We visualized uh, errors in uh, classification errors on the data set. And along the way we looked at a few data sets, the weather data, both the nominal and numeric version, the glass data and the iris data set. This class is all about evaluation. In lesson 1.4 we built a classifier using J48. In this first lesson of the second class we're going to see what it's like to actually be a classifier ourselves. And then later on in subsequent lessons in this class we're going to look at more about evaluation, training and testing, uh, baseline accuracy and cross-validation.
first of all, we're going to see what it's like to be a classifier. We're going to construct a decision tree ourselves interactively. So I'm going to just uh, open up Weka here, the Weka Explorer. I'm going to load a data set, the segment challenge data set. Segment challenge.arf, that's the one I want. And uh, we're going to look at this data set. Uh, so let's first of all look at the class. Class values are brick face, sky, foliage, cement, window, path, and grass. It looks like this is kind of an image analysis data set. When we look at the attributes, we see things like the centroid of columns and rows, pixel counts, line densities, means of intensities, and uh, various other things. Saturation, hue. And the class, as I said before, is different kinds of texture, I guess, brick, sky, foliage, and so on. So that's the segment challenge data set. Now I'm going to select the user classifier. The user classifier is a tree classifier, and we'll see what it does in just a minute. That's the user classifier. Uh, and uh, before I start, this is uh, uh, really quite important. I'm going to use a supplied test set. So I'm going to set the test set, which is used to evaluate the classifier, to be segment test. The training set is segment challenge. The test set is segment test. OK, now we're all set. I'm going to start, start the classifier. And what we see is the window with two panels, the tree visualizer and the data visualizer. Let's start with the data visualizer. We looked at visualization in the last class, how you can uh, select different attributes for the X and Y. I'm going to plot the region centroid row against the intensity mean. There we go. That's the plot I get. I should make this a little bit bigger, I think. OK, so now we're going to select a class. I'm going to use, I'm going to select a rectangle. So we're going to select a rectangle. And if I draw out with my mouse a rectangle here, I'm going to have a rectangle of, that's pretty well pure reds as far as I can see. Now I'm going to submit this rectangle. And you can see that that area has gone and the picture has been rescaled. Now I'm building up a tree here. If I look at the tree visualizer, I've got a tree. I center this tree, perhaps fit to screen. So we've split on, uh, on uh, these two attributes, region centroid row and intensity mean. And uh, here we've got sky. These are all sky classes. And here we've got a mixture of brick face, foliage, cement, window, path, and grass. So we're kind of going to build up this tree. What I want to do is to take this node and refine it a bit more. So here's the data visualizer again. I'm going to select a rectangle containing, say, these items here. And submit that. They've gone from this picture. And you can see that here I've created this split, split on region centroid row, another split on region centroid row and intensity mean. And here this is almost all path, 233 path instances, and then a mixture here. So this is a, this is a pure node we got over there. This is almost a pure node here. This is the one I want to work on. I'm going to cover some of those instances now. Let's, uh, let's take this lot here and submit that, and then I'm going to take this lot here, 
and submit that. And now I'm going to take, I think maybe I'll take those ones there, submit that, this little cluster here, seems pretty uniform, submit that. Now I haven't actually changed the axes, but of course at any time I could change these axes to uh, better separate the remaining classes, you know, so I could kind of mess around with these. Actually, the quick way to do it is to click here on these bars, uh, left click for X and right click for Y, and I can quickly explore different, uh, different uh, pairs of axes to see if I can get a better split. Now, here's the tree I've created. I'm going to fit it to the screen, and it looks like this. And you can see we've kind of successively elaborated down this branch here. When I finish with this, I can accept the tree. Actually, before I do that, let me just show you that uh, we were selecting rectangles here, but I've got other things. I can select a polygon or a polyline. If I don't want to use rectangles, I can use polygons or polylines. And uh, if you like, you can experiment with those to select different shaped areas. There is an area that I've got selected. I just can't quite finish it off. All right, I uh, right click to finish it off, so I could submit that. So I don't, I'm not confined to rectangles. I can use different shapes. Anyway, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be satisfied with this tree for the moment, so I'm going to accept the tree. And once I do this, there's no going back. So you want to be sure. If I accept the tree, are you sure? Yes. So uh, here I've got a confusion matrix, and I can look at the errors. My tree classifies 78% of the instances correctly, and it's nearly 79 correctly, and 21 incorrectly. That's not too bad, especially considering how quickly I built that tree. So it's over to you now. Uh, I'd like you to uh, play around and see if you can do better than this by spending a little bit longer on getting a nice tree. And I'd like you to reflect on a couple of things. First of all, what strategy you're using to build this tree. Basically, we're covering different regions of the instance space, trying to get pure regions to create pure branches. So this is like a kind of a bottom-up covering strategy. We kind of cover this area, and this area, and this area. Actually, that's not how J48 works. When it builds trees, it tries to do a judicious split through the whole data set to, uh, at the very top level, it'll split the entire data set into two in a way that kind of doesn't necessarily separate out particular classes, but makes it easier when it starts working on each half of the data set, further splitting in a top-down manner in order to try and produce an optimal tree. And it will produce trees much better than the one that I just produced with the user classifier. And I'd also like you to reflect on what it is that we're trying to do here. I mean, given enough time, you could produce a perfect tree for the data set. But don't forget that the data set we've loaded is the training data set. We're going to evaluate this tree on a different data set, the test data set, which hopefully comes from the same source, but is not identical to the training data set. So we're not trying to precisely fit the training data set. We're trying to fit it in a way that generalizes to the kind of patterns exhibited in the data set. So we're looking for something that will perform well on the test data. And that kind of highlights the importance of evaluation in, in uh, machine learning. If, that's what this class is going to be about, different ways of evaluating your classifier. OK, that's it. There's uh, some uh, information in the course text about the user classifier, which you can read if you like. And uh, please go on and do the activity associated with this lesson and uh, produce your own classifier, hopefully you'll be able to do much better than me, given five or ten minutes. Good luck! 2.2 in Data Mining with Weka, and here we're going to look at training and testing in a little bit more detail. So here's a situation. We've got a machine learning algorithm, and we feed into it training data, and it produces a classifier basic machine learning situation. 
And with that classifier, we can test it with some independent test data. We could put that into the classifier and get some evaluation results. And separately, we can deploy the classifier in some real situation to make predictions on fresh data coming from the environment. It's really important in classification that when you're looking at your evaluation results, you only get reliable evaluation results if the test data is different from the training data. That's kind of what we're going to look at in, uh, in this lesson. So what if you've only got one data set? Well, if you've just got one data set, you should divide it into two parts. Maybe use some of it for training and some of it for testing, perhaps two-thirds of it for training and one-third of it for testing. It's really important that the training data is different from the test data. Both training and test sets are produced by independent sampling from an infinite population. That's the basic kind of scenario here, but they're different independent samples. It's not the same data. If it is the same data, then your evaluation results are misleading. They don't reflect what you should actually expect on new data when you deploy your classifier. Uh, so here we're going to uh, look at the segment data set which uh, we used in the last lesson. I'm going to open the segment challenge. I'm going to use a supplied test set. First of all, I'm going to use J48. There's the J48 tree learner. I'm going to use a supplied test set and I will set it to the appropriate segment test. File segment test.arf. We're going to open that. Now we've got a test set and uh, let's see how it does. In the last lesson on the same data with the user classifier, I think I got 79% accuracy. J48 does much better. It gets 96% accuracy on the same test set. Now, supposing I was to evaluate it on the training set, I can do that by just specifying under test options, use training set. Now it will train it again and evaluate it on the training set, which is not what you're supposed to do because you get misleading results. Here it's saying the accuracy is 99% on, uh, on the training set. That is not representative of what we would get using this on independent data. If we had just one data set, if we didn't have a test set, we could do a percentage split. Here's a percentage split. This is going to be 66% training data and 34% uh, test data. It's going to make a random split of the data set. And if I run that, I get 95%. That's just about the same as what we got when we had an independent test set, just slightly worse. Now, if I were to run it again, if we had a different split, we'd expect a slightly different result. But actually, I get exactly the same result, 95.098% accuracy. That's because Weka, before it does a run, it reinitializes the random number generator. The reason is to make sure that you can get repeatable results. If it didn't do that, then the results that you got would not be repeatable. However, if you wanted to have a look at the kind of differences that you might get on different runs, then there's a way of resetting the random number between each run, and we're going to look at that uh, in the next lesson. So that's this lesson. The basic assumption of machine learning is that the training and test sets are independently sampled from an infinite population, the same population. If you have just one data set, you should hold part of it out for testing maybe 33% as we just did, or perhaps 10%. We would expect a slight variation in results each time if we hold out a different set, but Weka produces the same results each time by design, by making sure it reinitializes the random number generator each time. And uh, we ran J48 on the segment challenge data set. So if you like, you can go and look at the course text on the training and testing, section 5.1, and please go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Bye for now. Hello again. In the last lesson, we looked at training and testing. We saw that we can evaluate a classifier on an independent test set, or 
using a percentage split with a certain percentage of the data set used to train and the rest used for testing. Or, and this is generally a very bad idea, we can evaluate it on the training set itself, which gives misleadingly optimistic performance figures. In this lesson, we're going to uh, have a look at a little bit more about training and testing. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do is repeatedly train and test using uh, a percentage split. Now, in the last lesson, we saw that if you simply repeat the training and testing, you get the same result each time because Weka initializes the random number generator before it does each run to make sure that you know what's going on when you do the same uh, experiment again tomorrow. But uh, there's a way of overriding that, and so we will be using independent random numbers on different occasions to train and to, to produce a percentage split of a data set into a training and test set. Okay, so I'm going to open the segment challenge data again. That's what we used before. And notice there's uh, 1,500 instances here. That's quite a lot. I'm going to go to classify. I'm going to choose J48, our standard method, I guess. I'm going to use a percentage split. And because we've got 1,500 instances, I'm going to choose 90% for training and just 10% for testing. I reckon that 10%, that is 150 instances for testing, is going to give us uh, a reasonable estimate. And we might as well train on as many as we can to get the most accurate classifier. Okay, so I'm going to run this. And the accuracy figure I get, this is what I got in the last lesson, is 96.6667%. Now, this is a misleadingly high accuracy here. I'm going to call that 96.7% or 0.967. And then I'm going to do it again and just see how much variation we get of that figure, initializing the random number generator to different amounts each time. If I go to the More Options menu, I get a number of options here, which are quite useful. Outputting the model, we're doing that. Outputting statistics, we can output different evaluation measures. We're doing the confusion matrix. We're storing the prediction for visualization. We can output the predictions if we want. We can do a cost-sensitive evaluation, and we can uh, set the random seed for cross-validation or percentage split. That's set by default to 1. I'm going to change that to 2, a different random seed. We could also output the source code for the classifier if we wanted. But I just want to, ch I just want to change the random seed, and then I want to run it again. So before we get, we got 0.967. And this time we get 0 0.94, 94%. Quite different, you see. And if I were then to change this again to, say, 3, and run it again, again I get uh, 94%. If I change it again to 4 and run it again, I get 96.7%. Uh, Let's do one more, change it to 5, run it again. And now we get 95.3%. So here's a table with these figures in. If we run it 10 times, we get uh, this set of results. And given this set of experimental results, we can calculate the mean and standard deviation. The sample mean is the sum of uh, all of these uh, error figures, or these uh, success rates, I should say, divided by the number 10 of them. That's uh, 0.949, about 95%. So that's really what we'd expect to get. That's a better estimate than the 96.7 that we started out with, a more reliable estimate. And we can calculate the sample variance. We take the deviation from the mean. We subtract the mean from each of these numbers, and we square that, add them up, and we divide not by n, but by n minus 1. That might surprise you, perhaps. The reason for it being n minus 1 is because we've actually calculated the mean from this sample. And uh, when the mean is calculated from the sample, you need to divide by n minus 1, leading to a slightly larger variance estimate than if you were to divide by n. Uh, so in this case, we take the square root of that, and in this case, we get uh, 
a standard deviation of 1.8%. So now you can see that the real performance of J48 on the segment challenge data set is approximately 95% accuracy, plus or minus approximately 2%. So anywhere, let's say between about 93 and 97% accuracy. So these figures that you get that Weka puts out for you are misleading. You need to be careful how you interpret them because uh, the uh, result is certainly not 95.3333%. There's a lot of variation on all of these figures. So remember, the basic assumption is the training and test sets are sampled independently from an infinite population. And you should expect a slight variation in results, perhaps more than just a slight variation in results. You can estimate the variation in results by setting the random number seed and repeating the experiment. And you can calculate the mean and standard deviation experimentally, which is what we just did. So off you go now and do the activity associated with this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye. Yeah. In this lesson, we're going to look at an important new concept called baseline accuracy. So we're going to actually use a new data set, the diabetes data set. So let's, I've got Weka here. I'm going to open diabetes. There it is. So a quick look at this data set. The class is uh, tested negative or tested positive for diabetes, I guess. We've got attributes like uh, preg, which I think is to do with a number of times uh, you've been pregnant. Uh, age, which is the age. Of course, we can learn more about this data set by looking at the ARF file itself. Uh, here is the diabetes data set, and you can see it's diabetes in Pima Indians. Um, a lot of information here, the attributes, number of times pregnant, plasma, glucose concentration, and so on. Diabetes pedigree function. Anyway, and uh, I'm going to uh, use percentage split, this one. And I'm going to try a few different classifiers. Let's look at uh, J48 first, our old friend, J48. So we get 96% with J48. We can look at some other classifiers. You'll learn about these classifiers later on in this course, but right now we're just going to look at a few. Look at Naive Bayes in the Bayes category, the Naive Bayes classifier, and run that. And here we get 77%. A little bit better, but probably not significant. Let's uh, choose uh, in the lazy category. I'm going to choose IBK. Again, we'll learn about this later on. And here we get 73%, uh, quite a bit worse. And we'll use one final one, the part partial rules in the rules category, the part procedure. And here we get 74%. Uh, so we'll learn about these classifiers later, but they're just different classifiers. Alternative to J48. And you can see that uh, J48 and Naive Bayes are pretty good, probably about the same. The 1% difference between them probably isn't significant. IBK and PART are probably about the same performance. Again, the 1% between them. There's a fair gap, I guess, between those bottom two and the top two, which probably is significant. Anyway, I'd just like to think about these figures. 76%, you know, is that good to get 76% accuracy? Well, if we go back and look at this data set, the class, we see that there are 500 negative instances and 268 positive instances. So if you had to guess, you'd guess it was going to be negative, and you'd be right, 500 over 768, the sum of these two things, the total number of instances, you'd be right that fraction of the time. 500 over 768 if you always guess positive, and that works out to 65%. Actually, there's a classifier, a rules classifier called 0R, which does exactly that. 
the 0R classifier just looks for the most popular class and guesses that all the time. If I run this on the training set, that'll give us the exact same number, 500 over 768, which is 65%. So it's a very, very simple kind of trivial classifier that always just guesses the most popular class. It's okay to evaluate that on the training set because it's hardly using the training set at all to form the classifier. So that's what we would call the baseline. So using uh, using the, the baseline gives 65% accuracy, and J48 gives 76% accuracy. So it's, it's significantly above the baseline, but not all that much above the baseline. So it's always good when you're looking at these figures to consider what the very simplest kind of classifier, the baseline classifier, would get you. Sometimes baseline might give you the best results. I mean, I'm going to open a data set here. We're not going to discuss this data set. It's a bit of a strange data set. I'm not really designed for this kind of classification, but it's called Supermarket. I'm going to open Supermarket, and without even kind of looking at it, I'm just going to apply a few schemes here. I'm going to apply 0R, and I get 63%, 64%. I'm going to apply J48. That's down here. And I think I'll use a percentage split for evaluation. It's not fair to use the training set here. So now I get 62, 63%. That's worse than the baseline. If I try Naive Bayes, these are the ones I tried before. I get, again, 63% worse than the baseline. If I choose uh, IBK, that's in Lazy. IBK. Uh, this is going to take a little while here. It's a rather slow scheme. And here we are. It's finished now. Only 38%. That is way, way worse than the baseline. And we'll just try part, partial decision rules. And here we get 63%. So the upshot is that the baseline actually gave a better performance than any of these other classifiers, and one of them was really atrocious compared with the baseline. This is because for this data set, the attributes are not really informative. So the rule here is, don't just apply Weka to a data set blindly. You need to understand what's going on. And when you do apply Weka to a, da a data set, always make sure that you try the baseline classifier 0R before doing anything else. In general, simplicity is best. Always try simple classifiers before you try more complicated ones. Also, you should consider when you get these small differences whether the differences are likely to be significant. We saw these 1% differences we saw in the last lesson. They're probably not at all significant. We should always try a simple baseline. We should look at the data set. We shouldn't blindly apply Weka to a data set. We should try to understand what's going on. So that's this lesson. Off you go and do the uh, activity associated with this lesson, and I'll see you soon. Hi. In this lesson, lesson 2.5, I want to introduce you to the standard way of evaluating the performance of a machine learning algorithm, which is called cross-validation. So a couple of lessons back, we looked at evaluating on an independent test set. And we also talked about evaluating on the training set. Don't do that. And uh, we also talked about evaluating using the holdout method by taking the one data set and holding out a little bit for testing and using the rest for training. There's a fourth option on Weka's classified panel, which is called cross-validation. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Cross-validation is a way of improving upon repeated holdout. We tried uh, using the holdout method with different uh, random number seeds uh, each time, and uh, that's a repeated holdout. Uh, Cross-validation is a systematic way of doing repeated holdout that actually improves upon it by reducing the variance of the estimate. 
So, you know, we take a training set and we create a, uh, a, a classifier and then we're looking to evaluate the performance of that classifier and there's a certain amount of variance in that evaluation because it's all statistical underneath. And we want to keep the variance in the estimation as low as possible. So cross-validation is a way of reducing the variance and a variant on cross-validation called stratified cross-validation uh, reduces it even further. Now I'm going to explain that in this class. So, uh, in a previous lesson, we held out 10% for testing, and we repeated that 10 times. That's the repeated holdout method. So we've got one data set, and we divided it independently 10 separate times into training and uh, training set and a test set. Now, with cross-validation, we divide it just once, but we divide it into, say, 10 pieces. And then we take nine of the pieces and use them for training, and the last piece and use it for testing. And then with the same division, we take another nine pieces and use them for training, and the held out piece for testing. And we do the whole thing ten times, using a different segment for testing each time. So in other words, we divide the data set into ten pieces, and then we hold out each of these pieces in turn, for testing, train on the rest, do the testing, and average the results, average the 10 results. That would be 10-fold cross-validation. Divide the data set into 10 parts, these are called folds, hold out each part in turn, average the results. So each data point in the, uh, in the data set is used once for testing and nine times for training. That's 10-fold cross-validation. Stratified cross-validation is a simple variant where when we do the initial division into 10 parts, we ensure that each fold has got approximately the correct proportion of each of the class values. Of course, there's many, many, many different ways of dividing a data set into 10 parts, 10 equal parts. Uh, we just make sure we choose a division that has approximately the right representation of class values in each of the folds. That's stratified cross-validation, and it helps reduce the variance in the estimate a little bit more. Then, once we've done the cross-validation, what Weka does is run the algorithm an 11th time on the whole data set, and that would then produce a classifier that we might deploy in practice. So we use tenfold cross-validation in order to get an, an evaluation result, an estimate of the error, and then finally we do classification one more time to get an actual classifier to use in practice. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Cross-validation is better than repeated holdout, and we'll look at that in the next lesson. Stratified cross-validation is even better. Weka does stratified cross-validation by default. Uh, and uh, with tenfold cross-validation, Weka invokes the learning algorithm 11 times, one for each fold of the cross-validation, and then a final time on the entire data set. A practical rule of thumb is that if you've got lots of data, you can use a percentage split and evaluate it just once. Otherwise, if you don't have too much data, you should use stratified tenfold cross-validation. How big is lots? Well, this is what everyone asks. How long is a piece of string? You know, it's, uh, it's hard to say, but it depends on a few things. So uh, it depends on the number of classes in your data set. If you've got a two-class data set, then if you had, uh, say, 100 to 1,000 uh, samples, data points, that would probably be good enough for a pretty reliable evaluation. So if you did 90%, uh, 10% split in the training and test set, if you had, say, 10,000 data points in a two-class problem, then I think you'd have lots and lots of data. You wouldn't need to go to cross-validation. If, on the other hand, you had 100 different classes, then that's different, right? You would need a larger data set because you want a fair representation of each class when you do the evaluation. So it's really hard to say exactly. It depends on the circumstances. But if you've got thousands and thousands of data points, you might uh, just do things once with a holdout. Uh, if you've got less than 1,000 data points, uh, even with a two-class problem, then you might as well do tenfold cross-validation. It doesn't really take much longer. Well, it takes ten times as long, but the times are generally pretty short.
You can read more about this in section 5.3 of the course text on cross-validation. And now it's time for you to go and do the activity associated with this class. See you soon. Hi, good to see you again. One of the things I like to do with my time is play music. And that little bit of Mozart you hear at the beginning of uh, these videos, uh, that's me and three friends playing in a clarinet quartet. I was playing an orchestra, and last night I was playing some jazz with a little trio. If you want to hear us play, if you go to Google and just uh, find my homepage, type my name, Ian Witten, and uh, you'll uh, get me here, and uh, every time you visit this page, I'll play you a tune. And if you refresh the page, I'll play you another tune. Yeah, that's what I do. Anyway, that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about uh, Lesson 2.6, uh, which is uh, about cross-validation results. So we learned about cross-validation in the last lesson. And I said that cross-validation was a better way of evaluating your machine learning algorithm, evaluating your classifier, than repeated holdout, than repeating the holdout method. Cross-validation does things 10 times. You can use holdouts to do things uh, 10 times. But cross-validation is a better way of doing things. So uh, let's just do a little experiment here. I'm going to start out Weka and open the diabetes data set. Uh, here it is, diabetes.r. And the baseline accuracy, which 0R gives me, that's the default classifier, by the way, rules 0R. If I just run that, well, it will evaluate it using cross-validation. Actually, for a true baseline, I should just use a training set. That'll just look at the percentage of the chances of getting a correct result if we simply guess the most likely class, in this case 65.1%. Okay, that's the baseline accuracy. That's the first thing you should do with any data set. Then we're going to look at uh, J48, which is down here under trees. There it is, and uh, I'm going to evaluate it with tenfold cross validation. And it takes just a second to do that. I get a result of, let me just make this window bigger, 73, 73.8%. And we can change the random number seed like we did before. That's the default is 1, the random number seed of 2. Run it again. And I get 75%. Do it again. Change it to, say, 3. I can choose anything I want, of course. Uh, run it again. And I get 75.5%. Uh, so uh, these are the numbers I get on this slide, with uh, 10 different random number seeds. So those are the same numbers on this slide in the right-hand column. The 10 values I got, 73.8, 75, 75.5, and so on. And I can calculate the mean, the sample mean, which for that right-hand column is 74.5, and the sample standard deviation, which is 0 0.9, using just the same formulas that we used before. Before we used these formulas for the holdout method, we repeated the holdout 10 times. And uh, these are the results you get on this data set if you repeat holdout. That is using 90% for training and 10% for testing, which is, of course, what we're doing with cross-validation, tenfold cross-validation. And I would get those results there. And if I uh, average those, I get a mean of 74.8, which is satisfactorily close to 74.5. But I get a larger standard deviation, quite a lot larger, standard deviation of 4.5, 4.6, as opposed to 0 0.9 with cross-validation. Now, you might be asking yourself why use tenfold cross-validation. With Weka, we can use twenty-fold cross-validation or anything. We just set the number beside the number of folds here, beside the cross-validation uh, box to whatever we want. So we could use twentyfold cross-validation. What that would do is be to divide the data set into twenty equal parts and repeat twenty times, take one part out, train on the other ninety-five percent of the data set and then do it a 21st time on the whole data set. 
So why 10? Why not 20? Well, it's a good question, really, and there's not a very good answer. Um, we want to, uh, we, we'd like to use quite a lot of data for training because in the final analysis we're going to use the entire data set for training. Uh, so uh, it would be good to use, if we're using tenfold cross-validation, then we're using 90% of the data set for training. Maybe it would be a little better to use 95% of the data set for training with 20-fold cross-validation. On the other hand, we want to make sure that what we evaluate on is a valid statistical sample. So in general, it's not a, necessarily a good idea to use a large number of folds with cross-validation. Also, of course, 20-fold cross-validation will take twice as long as 10-fold cross-validation. So the upshot is that there isn't a, a really good answer to this question, but the standard thing to do is to use 10-fold cross-validation, and that's why it's Weka's default. So we've shown in this lesson that cross-validation really is better than repeated holdout. Remember, on the last slide, we find that we got about the same mean for repeated holdouts for cross-validation, but we got a much smaller variance for uh, cross-validation. So we know that the evaluation in, of this uh, machine learning method, J48, on this data set, diabetes, uh, we get 74.5% accuracy, probably somewhere between 73.5% and 75.5%. That is actually uh, substantially larger than the baseline, so J48 is doing something for us better than the baseline. Cross-validation reduces the variance of the estimate. Okay, that's the end of this class, so off you go and do the uh, activity, and uh, I'll see you at the next class. Bye for now. Hi, this is the third class of data mining with Weka, and in this class we're going to look at some simple machine learning methods and how they work. So we're going to start out emphasizing the message that simple algorithms often work very well. In data mining, maybe in life in general, you should always try simple things before you try more complicated things. And there are many different kinds of simple structure. For example, it might be that one attribute in the data set does all the work. Everything depends on the value of one of the attributes. Or it might be that all of the attributes contribute equally and independently. Or a simple structure might be a decision tree that tests just a few of the attributes. Or you might calculate the distance from a test uh, sample for an unknown sample to the nearest training sample, or well, the result might depend on a linear combination of attributes. And we're going to look at uh, all of these simple structures in the next few lessons. There's no universally best learning algorithm. The uh, success of a uh, machine learning method depends on the domain. Data mining really is an experimental science. So, we're going to look at now at the 1R rule learner, where one attribute does all the work. It's extremely simple, very trivial actually, but we're going to start with simple things and build up to more complex things. So, 1R learns what you might call a one-level decision tree, or a set of rules that all test one particular attribute, a tree that branches only at the root node, depending on the value of a particular attribute, or equivalently, a set of rules that uh, test the value of that particular attribute. So the basic version of 1R, there's one branch for each value of the attribute. We choose which attribute first. Then we make one branch for each possible value of the attribute. Each branch assigns the most frequent class that comes down that branch, and the error rate is the proportion of instances that don't belong to the majority class of their corresponding branch. We choose the attribute with the smallest error rate. Well, let's look at what this actually means. So, here's the algorithm. For each attribute, we're going to make some rules. For each value of the attribute, we're going to make a rule that counts how often each class appears, finds the most frequent class, makes the rule assign that most frequent class to this attribute value combination, and then we're going to calculate the error rate of this attribute's rules. And we're going to repeat that for each of the attributes in the data set, and choose the attribute with the smallest error rate. Here's the weather data again. So what 1R does is it looks at each attribute in turn, outlook, 
temperature, humidity and wind and forms rules based on that. So for outlook there are three possible values sunny, overcast and rainy and uh, we just count out of the five sunny instances uh, two of them are yeses and three of them are noes. Is that right? Sunny, no, sunny, no, sunny, no, sunny, yes, sunny, yes. So we're going to choose a, a rule, if it's sunny, then choose no, and we're going to get two errors out of five. For overcast, all of the four overcast values of outlook lead to yes uh, values for the class play. So we're going to choose the rule, if outlook is overcast, then uh, yes, giving us zero errors. And finally, for outlook is rainy, we're going to choose yes as well, and that will also give us two errors out of the five instances. So we've got a total number of errors if we branch on outlook of four. We can branch on temperature and do the same thing. So uh, when temperature is hot, there are two no's and two yes's. We just choose arbitrarily in the case of a tie. So we'll choose if it's hot, let's predict no, getting two errors. If the temperature is mild, we'll predict yes, getting uh, two out of six errors. And if the temperature is cool, we'll predict yes, getting one out of the uh, four instances as an error. And the same for humidity and wind. So we look at the total error values, we choose the rule with the lowest total error value, either outlook or humidity, that's a tie, so we'll just choose arbitrarily and choose outlook. That's how 1R works, it's as simple as that. So let's just try it, here's Weka, I'm going to open the weather data, the nominal weather data, and uh, I'm going to Got to classify. This is such a trivial uh, data set that the results aren't very meaningful. But anyway, if I just run 0R to start off with, I get an error rate of 64%. If I now choose 1R and run that, I get a rule. And the rule I get is if it's branch on outlook, if it's sunny, then choose no, overcast, choose yes, and rainy, choose yes. We get 10 out of 14 instances correct on the training set. We're evaluating this using cross validation. It doesn't really make much sense on such a small data set. Interesting though that the error rate we get, 42%, is pretty bad, worse than 0R. Actually, with any two-class problem, you could expect to get a success rate of at least 50%. Tossing a coin would give you 50%. So uh, this 1R uh, scheme is not performing very well on this rather trivial data set. Notice that the rule it finally prints out, uh, since we're using cross-validation, tenfold cross-validation, it does the whole thing ten times, and then on the eleventh time it calculates a rule from the entire data set, and that's what it prints out. So uh, that's where this rule comes from. Okay, so 1R, one attribute does all the work. This is a very simple method of machine learning described in 1993, 20 years ago, in a paper called Very Simple Classification Rules Perform Well on Most Commonly Used Data Sets by a guy called Rob Halty, who uh, uh, lives in Canada. And he did an experimental evaluation of the 1R method on 16 commonly used data sets. He used cross-validation, just like we've uh, told you, to evaluate these things. And he found that the simple rules from 1R often outperformed far more complex methods that had been proposed for these data sets. So how can such a simple method work so well? Well, some data sets really are simple. And others are so small or noisy or complex that you can't learn anything from them. So it's always worth trying the simplest things first. Section uh, 4.1 of the course text talks about 1R. And now it's time for you to go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Bye for now. Hi. Before we go on to talk about uh, some more simple classifier methods, we need to talk about overfitting. Any machine learning method may overfit the training data. That's when it produces a classifier that fits the training data too tightly and doesn't generalize well to independent test data. 
Do you remember the user classifier that you built at the beginning of class 2, where you built a classifier yourself? Imagine tediously putting a tiny circle around every single training data point. You could build a classifier very laboriously that would be 100% correct on the training data, but probably wouldn't generalize very well to independent test data. That's overfitting. It's a general problem. We're going to illustrate it with one R. So we're going to look at the uh, numeric version of the weather problem, where temperature and humidity are numbers and not nominal values. So if you think of how 1R works, when it comes to make a rule on the attribute temperature, it's going to make a complex rule that branches 14 different ways, perhaps, for the 14 different instances in the data set. And each rule is going to have zero errors. It's going to get it exactly right. So it's going to look like if we branch on temperature, we're going to get a rule, a perfect rule, with a total error count of zero. Now, in fact, 1R has got a parameter that limits the complexity of rules. And I'm not going to talk about how it works. It's pretty simple, but it's just a bit distracting and not very important how it works. The point is that the parameter uh, allows you to, uh, uh, to limit the complexity of the rules that are produced by 1R. So let's open the numeric weather data. And uh, we can go to uh, 1R and choose it. There is 1R. And uh, let's just create a rule. So now here, the rule is based on the outlook attribute. This is exactly what happened in the last lesson with the uh, nominal version of the weather data. Let's just remove the outlook attribute and try it again. Outlook. We're going to remove that attribute, and now let's see what happens when we classify with 1R. Well, now it branches on humidity. If humidity is less than 82.5, it's a yes day. If it's greater than 82.5, it's a no day. And that gets 10 out of 14 instances correct. So far, so good. That's using 1R's parameter, the default setting of 1R's parameter that controls the complexity of the rules it generates. We can go and look at 1R. And remember, you can configure a classifier by clicking on it. And we see that there is a parameter. Where is the parameter? It's called min bucket size. And it's set by 6 to default, which is a good compromise kind of value. I'm going to change that value to 1 and then see what happens. Run 1R again. And now I get a different kind of rule. It's branching many different ways on the temperature attribute. This rule is overfitted to the data set. It's a very accurate rule on the training data, but it won't generalize well to independent test data. Now let's see what happens with a more realistic data set. I'll open Diabetes, which is a numeric data set. All the attributes are numeric, and the class is either tested negative or tested positive. Let's run 0R to get a baseline figure for this data set. Here I get 65% for the baseline, so we really ought to be able to do better than that. Now let's run 1R. The default parameter settings, that is a value of 6 for 1R's parameter that controls rule complexity. We get 71%, 71.5%. That's pretty good. We're evaluating using cross-validation. And 1R outperforms the baseline accuracy by quite a bit, 71 versus 65. If we look at the rule, it branches on PLAS. This is the plasma glucose concentration. So depending on which of these regions the plasma glucose concentration falls into, then we're going to predict a negative or a positive outcome. That seems like quite a sensible rule. Now let's change 1R's parameter to make it overfit. We'll configure 1R and find the min bucket size parameter and change it to 1. When we run our 1R again, we get 57% 
accuracy quite a bit lower than the 0R baseline of 65%. And if you look at the rule, here it is. It's testing, what is it testing? It's testing a different attribute, pedi, which if you look at the comments on the R file, happens to be the diabetes pedigree function, whatever that is. You can see that this attribute has a lot of different values and it looks like we're branching on pretty well every single one. That gives us lousy performance when evaluated by cross-validation, which is what we're doing now. But if you were to evaluate it on the training set, you'd expect to see very good performance. Yes, here we get 87.5% uh, accuracy on the training set, which is very good for this data set. Of course, that figure is completely misleading. The rule is strongly overfitted to the training data set and it doesn't generalize well to independent test sets. That's a good example of overfitting. Overfitting is a general phenomenon that plagues all machine learning methods. We've illustrated it by playing around with the parameter of the 1R method, but it happens with all machine learning methods. It's one reason why you should never evaluate on the training set. And it can occur in more general contexts. Now let's suppose you've got a data set and you choose a very large number of machine learning methods, say a million different machine learning methods, and choose the best for your data set using cross-validation. Well, because you've used so many machine learning methods, you can't expect to get the same performance on new test data. You've chosen so many that the one that you've ended up with is going to be overfitted to the data set you're using. It's not sufficient just to use cross-validation and believe the results. In this case, you might divide the data three ways into a training set, a test set, and a validation set. Choose the method using the train and training and test set. By all means, use your million machine learning methods and choose the best on the training and set test set or the best using cross-validation on a training set. But then leave aside this a separate validation set for use at the end once you've chosen your machine learning method and evaluate it on that to get a much more realistic uh, assessment of how it will perform on independent test data. Overfitting is a really big problem in uh, machine learning. You can read uh, a bit more about uh, 1R and, how, and what this parameter actually does in the course text in section 4.1. And off you go now and do the activity associated with this class. Bye for now. Hi, this is lesson 3.3 on using probabilities. And it's the one bit of data mining with Weka that we're going to see a little bit of mathematics. But don't worry, I'll take you through it gently. So the 1R strategy that we've just been studying assumes that there is one of the attributes that does all the work, that takes the responsibility of the decision. That's a simple strategy. And another simple strategy is the opposite, to assume that all of the attributes contribute equally and independently to the decision. This is called the naive Bayes method. I'll explain the name later on. So there's two assumptions that underlie naive Bayes, the at that the attributes are equally important and that they're statistically independent. That is, knowing the value of one of the attributes doesn't tell you anything about the value of any of the other attributes. Now this independence assumption is never actually correct, but the method based on it often works well in practice. So there's a theorem in probability called Bayes' theorem after this guy Thomas Bayes from the 18th century. And it's about the probability of a hypothesis, H, given evidence. So in our case, the hypothesis is the class of an instance, and the evidence is the attribute values of the instance. And the theorem is that the probability of H given E, the class given the instance, the hypothesis given the evidence, is equal to the probability of E given H times the probability of H divided by the probability of E. So P of H by itself is the called the a priori probability of the hypothesis H. That's the probability of the event before any evidence is seen. So that's really um, the baseline probability of the event. So for example, in the weather data, I think there are nine yeses and five noes. So the baseline probability of the hypothesis play equals yes is 9 over 14. 
and plus y equals now is 5 over 14. And what this equation says is how to update that probability, pr of h, when you see some evidence to get what's called the a posteriori probability of h. That means afterwards, after the evidence. And the evidence in our case is the attribute values of an unknown instance. That's e. So that's Bayes' theorem. Now, what makes this method naive? The naive assumption is, I've said it before, the evidence splits into parts that are statistically independent. So the parts of the evidence in our case are the different attribute values, the four different attribute values in the weather data. And when you have independent events, the probabilities multiply. So the probability of H given E, according to the top equation, is the probability of E given H times the prior probability PR of H divided by the probability of the evidence. And the probability of E given H splits up into these parts. The probability of E1 given H, the first attribute value, E2 given H, the second attribute value, and so on for all of the attributes. Well, that's maybe a bit abstract. Let's look at the actual weather data. Here it is on the right-hand side, the weather data. And in the large table at the top, we've taken each of the attributes, outlook, start with outlook. And we've looked at under the yes hypothesis and the no hypothesis, how many times the outlook is sunny. It's sunny twice under yes and three times under no. That comes straight from the data in the table. Overcast. Well, when the outlook is overcast, it's always a yes instance. So there are four of those and zero no instances. And then rainy is three yes instances and two no instances. So those numbers just come straight from the uh, data table given the instance values. And then we take those numbers and underneath we make them into probabilities. So let's say we know the hypothesis. That is, let's say we know it's a yes then the probability of it being sunny is 2 ninths, overcast 4 ninths, and rainy 3 ninths, simply because when you add up 2 plus 4 plus 3, you get 9. So those are the probabilities. And if we know that the outcome is no, the probabilities are sunny uh, 3 fifths, overcast 0 fifths, and rainy 2 fifths. That's for the outlook attribute. That's what we're looking for, you see, the probability of each of these uh, uh, attribute values given a hypothesis, H. So the next attribute is temperature, and we just do the same thing with that to get the probabilities of the three values, hot, mild, and cool, under the yes hypothesis or the no hypothesis. And the same with humidity and windy. And play, uh, that's the prior probability, PR of H. It's yes, 9 fourteenths of the time, no, 5 fourteenths of the time, even if you don't know anything about the attribute values. So the equation we're looking at is this one below, and we just need to work it out. So here's an example. Here's an unknown day, a new day. We don't know what the value of play is, but we know it's sunny, cool, high, and windy. Windy is true. So we can just multiply up these probabilities. If we multiply for the yes, hypothesis, we get 2 ninths times 3 ninths times 3 ninths times 3 ninths. Those are just the numbers on the previous slide. PR of E1 given H, E2 given H, E4 given H, finally PR of H, that is 9 fourteenths. And uh, that gives us a probability of 0 0.0053 when you, uh, a likelihood I should say of 0 0.0053 when you multiply them. And then from the no class, we do the same to get a likelihood of 0 0.0206. These numbers are not probabilities. Probabilities have to add up to 1. They're likelihoods. But we can get the probabilities from them by using a straightforward technique of normalization. Likelihoods for yes and no, and we normalize them as shown below to make them add up to 1. That's how we get the uh, the probability of play on a new day with different attribute values. So just to go through that again, the evidence is outlook is sunny, temperature is cool, humidity is high, windy is true, we don't know what play is. The probability of a yes given the evidence is the product of those four probabilities, for one for outlook, temperature, humidity, and windy, times the prior probability. 
which is just the um, baseline probability of a yes. And that gives us the that uh, product of fractions divided by PR of E. We don't know what PR of E is, but it doesn't matter because we can do the same calculation for PR of no given E, which gives us another equation just like this. And then we can calculate the actual probabilities by normalizing them so that the two probabilities add up to one. PR of yes given E plus PR of no given E equals one. It's actually quite simple when you look at it in numbers. And it's very simple when you look at it in Weka as well. I'm going to go to Weka here. I'm going to open the nominal weather data, which is here. Uh, and we've seen that before, of course, many times. I'm going to uh, go to classify. I'm going to use the naive Bayes method. It's under this Bayes category here. There's a lot of implementations of different variants of Bayes. I'm just going to use the straightforward naive Bayes method here. And then I'll just run it. So this is what we get. The success probability calculated according to cross-validation. More interestingly, we get uh, the model. And the model is just like the table I showed you before for divided under the yes class and the no class. We've got the four attributes, outlook, temperature, humidity, and windy. And then uh, we've got for each of the attribute values, we've got the number of times that attribute value appears. Now there's one little and important difference between this table and the one I showed you before. Let me go back to my slide and look at these numbers. You can see that for outlook under yes on my slide, I've got two, four, and three. And uh, Weka has got three, five, and four. That's one more each time for a total of 12 instead of a total of nine. The reason is that Weka adds one to all of the counts. And the reason it does this is to get rid of the zeros. In the original table, under Outlook, under No, the probability of overcast given No is zero. And we're going to be multiplying that into things. So what that would mean in effect, if we took that zero at face value, is that the probability of the class being no given any day for which overcast outlook was overcast would be zero, because anything multiplied by zero is zero. These zeros in probability terms have a sort of a veto over all of the other numbers. And we don't want that. We don't want to categorically conclude that it must be a no day on the basis of the it's overcast, and we've never seen an overcast outlook on a no day before. It's called the zero frequency problem. And Weka's solution, the most common solution, is very simple. We just add one to all the counts. So that's why all those numbers in the Weka table are one bigger than the numbers in the table on the slide. Aside from that, it's all exactly the same. So we're avoiding zero frequencies by effectively starting all counts at one instead of starting them at zero. So they can't be end up at zero. OK, that's the naive Bayes method. The assumption is that all attributes contribute equally and independently to the outcome. And it works surprisingly well, even in situations where the independent assumption is clearly violated. Why does it work so well when the assumption is wrong? Well, that's a good question. Basically, classification doesn't need accurate probability estimates. We're just going to choose as the class the thing with the largest, the outcome with the largest probability. So as long as the greatest probability is assigned to the correct class, it doesn't matter if the probability estimates are all that accurate. This actually means that if you add redundant attributes, you get problems with naive Bayes. The extreme case of dependence is where two attributes have got the same values identical attributes. And uh, that will cause havoc with the naive Bayes method. However, Weka contains methods for attribute selection to allow you to select a subset of fairly independent attributes, after which you can safely use naive Bayes. Uh, there's quite a bit of stuff on statistical modeling in section 4.2 of the course text. And uh, now you need to go and do that activity. See you soon. Hi. Here in Lesson 3.4, we're continuing our exploration of simple classifiers by looking at decision trees, classifiers that produce decision trees. And uh, we're going to look at uh, J48. 
uh, we've used this classifier quite a bit so far. Let's have a look at how it works inside. So J48 is based on a top-down strategy, a recursive divide-and-conquer strategy. You select which attribute to split on at the root node, and then you create a branch for each possible attribute value, and uh, that splits the instances into subsets, one for each branch, ex that extends from the root node, and then you repeat the procedure recursively for each branch, selecting an attribute at each node, and of course you use only instances that reach that branch to make the selection. And then at the end you stop, perhaps you might continue until all instances have the same class. So the trick is, the question is, how do you do the selection? How do you select a good attribute for the root node? Well, this is the weather data. and As you can see, Outlook has been selected for the root node. Well, here are the four possibilities, outlook, windy, humidity, and temperature. And these are the consequences of splitting on each of these attributes. Now, what we're really looking for is a pure split, a split into pure nodes. We would be delighted if we find an attribute that split exactly into one node where they're all yeses and another node where they're all nos and perhaps a third node where they're all yeses again. That would be the best thing. What we don't want is mixtures because when we get mixtures of yeses and nos at a node then we've got to split again. So you can see splitting an outlook looks pretty good. We get uh, one branch with two yeses and three nos and then we get a pure yes branch for overcast and when outlook is rainy we get three yeses and two nodes. Two nos. So how are we going to quantify this to decide which one of these attributes produces the purest nodes? We're on a quest here for purity. Well, the aim is to get the smallest tree. And top-down tree induction methods uh, use some kind of heuristic. And the most popular heuristic to produce pure nodes is an information theory-based heuristic. I'm not going to explain information theory to you. That would be another MOOC of its own. Quite an interesting one, actually. Information theory was uh, founded by uh, Claude Shannon, an American mathematician and scientist who died about 12 years ago. He was an amazing guy. He did some amazing things. One of the most amazing things, I think, is that he could ride a unicycle and juggle clubs at the same time when he was in his 80s. That's pretty impressive, I think. Anyway, he came up with the whole idea of information theory and quantifying entropy, which measures information in bits. And this is the formula for entropy. It's a sum of a P log P's for each of the possible outcomes. And I'm not really going to explain it to you. All those minus signs are there because logarithms are negative if numbers are less than one, and probabilities always are less than one. So the entropy comes out to be a positive number. So what we do is we look at the information gain. How much information in bits do you gain by knowing the value of an attribute? That is, the entropy of the distribution before the split minus the entropy of the distribution after the split. And here's how it works out for the weather data. These are the number of bits. If you split an outlook, you gain 0.247 bits. Now, I know you might be surprised to see fractional numbers of bits. Normally, we think of 1 bit or 8 bits or 32 bits. But the information theory shows how you can regard bits as fractions. And these produce fractional numbers of bits. I don't want to go into the details. And you can see that Windy gives you, knowing the value for Windy, gives you only 0.048 bits of information. Humidity is uh, quite a bit better. Temperature is way down there at 0 0.029 bits. So we're going to choose the attribute that gains the most bits of information, and that, in this case, is Outlook. So at the top level of this tree, at the root node, we're going to split on Outlook. Well, having decided to split on Outlook, we need to look at each of the three branches that emanate from Outlook, corresponding to three possible values of Outlook, and uh, consider what to do at each of those branches. So at the first branch, we might split on temperature or windy, or humidity. We're not going to split on Outlook again because we know that Outlook is sunny. All instances that reach this place, the Outlook is sunny.
So for the other three things, we do exactly the same thing. We evaluate the information gain for temperature at that point, for windy and humidity, and we choose the best. In this case, it's humidity with a gain of 0.971 bits, because you can see that if we branch on humidity around here, then we get pure nodes, three nodes in one and two yeses in another. And when we get that, we don't need to split anymore. We're again on a quest for purity. So that's how it works. It just carries on until it reaches the end, until it has pure nodes. So let's uh, open up Weka and uh, just do this with the nominal weather data. Of course, we've done this before, but I'll just do it again. It won't take long. J48 is kind of the workhorse data mining algorithm. There's the data. We're going to uh, choose J48. It's a tree classifier. There we go, and we're going to run this, and uh, we get a tree, the very tree I showed you before, split first on Outlook, sunny, overcast, rainy, and then if it's sunny, split on humidity, three uh, instances reach that node, then split on normal, three yes instances reach that node, and so on. Or we can look at the tree using the uh, visualize, the right click menu, visualize the tree, here it is. And we'll fit that to the screen. And these are the number of yes instances that reach this node and the number of no instances. In the case of this particular tree, of course, we're using cross-validation here. So it's done an 11th run on the whole data set. And it's given us these numbers by looking at the training set. So in fact, uh, all of uh, this becomes a pure kind of node here. Sometimes you get two numbers here, 3 slash 2 or 3 slash 1. And uh, those indicate, the first number indicates the number of correct things that reach that node. So in this case, the number of no's. And then if there was another number following the 3, that would indicate the number of yeses, that is, incorrect things that reach that node. But that doesn't occur in this uh, very simple situation. So there you have it, J48, top-down induction of decision trees. It's soundly based in information theory. It's a pretty good data mining algorithm. Maybe 10 years ago, I might have said it was the best data mining algorithm, but some uh, uh, even better ones, I think, have been produced uh, since then. However, the real advantage of J48 is that it's reliable, it's robust, and most importantly of all, it produces a tree that people can understand. It's very easy to understand the output of J48, and that's really important when you're applying data mining. There are a lot of different criteria you could use for attribute selection. Here we're using information gain. Actually, in practice, these don't normally make a huge difference. There are some important modifications that need to be done to this algorithm to be useful in practice. I've only really explained the basic principles. The actual J48 incorporates some more, some more complex stuff to make it work under different circumstances in practice. And we'll talk about those in the next lesson. Section 4.3 of the text, uh, Divide and Conquer, Constructing Decision Trees, explains the simple version of J48 that I've explained here. And then now you should go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Good luck. See you next time. Hi. In the last class, we looked at a bare bones algorithm for constructing decision trees. To get an industrial strength decision tree induction algorithm, we need to add some more complicated stuff, notably pruning. So we're going to talk in this class about pruning decision trees. Here's a guy pruning a tree, and that's a good image to have in your mind when we're talking about decision trees. We're looking at those little twigs and little branches around the edge of the tree, seeing if they're worthwhile, and snipping them off if they're not uh, contributing. That way we'll get a decision tree that might perform worse on the training data, but perhaps generalizes better to independent test data. And of course, that's what we want. So here's the weather data again. I'm sorry to keep harking back to the weather data, but it's just a nice, simple example that we all know now. But I've added here a new attribute. I call it an ID code attribute, which is different for each instance. I've just given them an identification code, A, B, C, and so on. And let's just think from the last lesson what's going to happen when we consider which is the best attribute to split on at the root, the first decision. 
we're going to be looking for the information gain from each of our attributes separately. And we're going to gain a lot of information by choosing the ID code. Actually, if you split on the ID code, that tells you everything about the instance we're looking at. So that's going to be a maximal amount of information gained. And clearly, we're going to split on that, uh, on that attribute at the root node of the decision tree. But that's not going to generalize very well. It's not going to generalize at all to new weather instances. So to get around this problem, having constructed a decision tree, decision tree algorithms then automatically prune it back. You don't see any of this. It just happens when you click the uh, when you start the algorithm in Weka. So how do we prune? Well, there are some simple techniques for pruning, and some more complicated techniques for pruning. A very simple technique is to not to continue splitting if the nodes get very small. So you know, we said in the last, I said in the last lesson that we're going to keep splitting until each node has uh, uh, just one class associated with it. Well, perhaps that's not such a good idea. If we get a very small node with a couple of instances, it's probably not worth splitting that node. So that's actually a parameter in J48. I've got Weka going here. I'm going to choose J48 and look at the parameters. Trees, J48, and. You know, look at the parameters here. There's a parameter called min num obj. If I mouse over that parameter, it says the minimum number of instances per leaf. The default value for that is two. The second thing we do is to build a full tree and then work back from the leaves. It turns out to be better to build a full tree and prune back rather than trying to do forward pruning as you're building the tree. And we apply a statistical test at each stage. That's the confidence factor parameter. And it's here, the default value is 0.25. The confidence factor used for pruning. Smaller values incur more pruning. And then sometimes it's good to prune an interior node and to raise the subtree beneath that interior, no interior node up one level. And that's called subtree raising. That's uh, this parameter here, we can switch it on or switch it off, whether to consider the subtree raising operation uh, during pruning. Subtree raising actually uh, increases the complexity of the algorithm, so it would work quicker, uh, work faster if you turned off subtree raising on a large problem. Now, I'm not going to talk about the details of these methods. Pruning is a messy and complicated subject, and it's not particularly illuminating. And actually, I don't really recommend playing around with these parameters here. The default values on J48 tend to do a pretty good job. And of course, it's become apparent, I guess, to you now that pruning, the need to prune, is really a result of the original unpruned tree overfitting the, uh, the data set, the training data set. This is another instance of overfitting. Sometimes simplifying a decision tree gives better results. Not just a smaller, more manageable tree, but actually better results. So I'm going to open the diabetes data. Which is here. And I'm going to go and choose J48. And I'm just going to run it with the default parameters. And uh, I get an accuracy of 73.8% evaluated using cross-validation. And the tree, you can see here, the size of the tree is 20 leaves and a total of 39 nodes. So that's 19 interior nodes and 20 leaf nodes. And there, of course, we see the tree. So let's switch off pruning. J48 prunes by default. We're going to switch off pruning. And we've got an unpruned option here, which is false, which means it's pruning. I'm going to change that to true. So unpruned is true, which means it's not pruning anymore. And run it again. And now we get a slightly worse result, 72.7%. Probably not significantly worse. We actually get a slightly larger tree, 22 leaves and 43 nodes. So it's a double whammy, really. We've got a bigger tree, which is harder to understand. And we've got a slightly worse prediction result. We would prefer the pruned result, I think, on, in this example, in this data set. I'm going to show you a more extreme example with the breast cancer data. I don't think we've looked at the breast cancer 
data before. Here it is. The class is no recurrent events versus recurrence events. And there's attributes like age and menopause, tumor size, and so on. I'm going to go and classify this with J48. In the default configuration, I need to switch on pruning. That is, make unpruned false. And then run it. I get an accuracy of 75.5%, and I get a fairly small tree with four leaves and two internal nodes. I can look at that tree here, or I can visualize the tree. Of course, if I just go over here, visualize the tree, a little bit bigger, fit it to the screen, and we get this nice, simple little decision structure here, which is quite comprehensible and performs pretty well, 75% accuracy. I'm going to switch off pruning. Make unpruned true. Run it again. And first of all, I get a, a much worse result, 69.6, .6, probably significantly worse than the 75.5 I had before. More importantly, I get a huge tree, 152 leaves, 175 internal nodes. It's massive, and if I try and visualize that, I probably won't be able to see very much. Here it is. I can try and uh, fit that to my screen. And it's still impossible to see what's going on here. In fact, if I look at the textual description of the tree, I get, uh, well, it's just extremely complicated. So that's a bad thing. Here, an unpruned tree is a very bad idea. We get a huge tree which does quite a bit worse than a much simpler decision structure. So in general, uh, J48 does uh, pruning by default, and in general, you should let it do pruning according to the default parameters. That would be my recommendation. So that's it. We've talked about J48, or in other words, C4.5. Remember in Lesson 1.4, we talked about the progression from C4.5 by Ross Quinlan. Uh, here is a picture of Ross Quinlan, an Australian computer scientist, at the bottom of the screen. The progression from C4.5 from ROS to J48, which is the Java implementation essentially equivalent to C4.5. It's a very popular method. It's a simple method, easy to use, and decision trees are very attractive because you can look at them and see what the structure of the decision is, see what's important about your data. There are many different uh, pruning methods, and uh, they their main effect is to change the size of the tree. They have a small effect on the accuracy, and it often makes the accuracy worse. Uh, but they often have a huge effect on the size of the tree, as we just saw with the breast cancer data. Pruning is actually a general technique to guard against overfitting, and it can be applied to structures other than trees, structures like decision rules. There's a lot more we could say about decision trees. For example, we've been talking about univariate decision trees, that is, ones that have a single test at each node. But you can imagine a multivariate tree where there's a compound test. The test at a node might be if this attribute is that and that attribute is something else. You can imagine uh, more complex decision trees produced by more complex decision tree algorithms. But in general, C4.5, J48, is a popular and useful workhorse algorithm for data mining. You can read more about a lot more about decision trees if you go to the course text. This uh, tells you about pruning and uh, gives you the mathematical details of the uh, pruning methods that I've just sketched here in section 6.1. And uh, it's time for you to do the activity, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye. Hi, I'm sitting here in New Zealand. It's on the globe behind me. That's New Zealand at the top of the world, surrounded by water. Uh, but that's not where I'm from originally. I uh, moved here about 20 years ago. Uh, here on this map, uh, of course, this is New Zealand. Google puts things with the north at the top, which is probably what you're used to. I came here from Calgary in Canada, the University of Calgary, where I was for many years. I used to be head of computer science at the University of Calgary. But originally, I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland, which is here in the United Kingdom. So my accent actually is Northern Irish, not New Zealand. This is not a New Zealand accent. 
Okay, we're going to talk here in the last lesson of class 3 about another machine learning method called the nearest neighbor or instance based machine learning method. When people talk about route learning, they just talk about remembering stuff. They're talking about just remembering stuff without really thinking about it. And uh, it's the simplest kind of learning. So a nearest neighbor implements route learning. To classify, it just remembers the training instances, and then to classify a new instance, it searches the training set for one that's most like the new instance. So the representation of the knowledge here is just a set of instances. It's a kind of lazy learning. The learner does nothing until it has to do some predictions. And confusingly, it's also called instance-based learning. Nearest neighbor learning and instance-based learning are the same thing. So here's just a little picture of instance space, two-dimensional instance space. And we've got the blue points and the white points, uh, two different classes, you know, yes and no, for example. And then we've got an unknown uh, instance, the red one. We want to know which class it's in. So we simply find the closest instance in each of the classes and see which is closest. So in this case, it's the blue class. So we would classify that red point as though it belonged to the blue class. And if you think about this, that's uh, implicitly drawing a line between the two clouds of points. It's a straight line here, the perpendicular bisector of the line that joins the two closest points. So the nearest neighbor method produces a linear decision boundary. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It produces a piecewise linear decision boundary with a bunch of, uh, sometimes a bunch of uh, little linear pieces of the decision boundary. So the trick, of course, is what do we mean by most like? We need a similarity function, and uh, conventionally people use the regular distance function, the Euclidean distance, which is the sum of the squares of the differences. Well, it's a, the differences between the attributes. It's the square root of the sum of the squares, but we're, since we're just comparing two distances, we don't need to take the square root. Well, you might use the what's called the Manhattan or city block distance, which is the sum of the absolute differences between the attribute values. Of course, I've been talking about uh, numeric attributes here. If attributes are nominal, we need uh, the difference between uh, different attribute values. And uh, uh, conventionally, people just say the distance is 1 if the attribute values are different, and 0 if they're the same. And it might be a good idea with nearest neighbor learning to normalize the attributes so that they all lie between 0 and 1, so the distance isn't skewed by some attribute that happens to be on some gigantic scale. Okay, uh, what about noisy instances? If we, get, if we have a noisy data set, then by accident we might find uh, an incorrectly classified training instance as the nearest one to our test instance. Now you can guard against that by using k nearest neighbors, say 3. k might be 3 or 5. And you look for the 3 or the 5 nearest neighbors and choose the majority class amongst those when classifying an unknown point. So that's the k nearest neighbor method. And in Weka, it's called IBK, instance-based learning with parameter k. And it's in the lazy class. So let's uh, open the glass data set, which is here. Go to classify and choose the lazy classifier IBK. And uh, well, let's just run it. And we get a Accuracy of uh, 70, 70 percent, 70.6 percent. The model is not really printed here because there is no model. It's just a set of training instances. We're using tenfold cross-validation, of course. Let's change the value of k. So this knn, this k value here, uh, is set by default to 1, the number of neighbors to use. So we'll change that to, say, 5. And run that. And in this case, we get a slightly worse result, 67.8% with k as 5. This is not such a noisy data set, I guess. If we change it to, say, 20, and run it again, we get 65% uh, accuracy, slightly worse again. So if we had a noisy data set, we might find that the accuracy figures improved as k got a little bit larger.
But then it would always start to decrease again if we set k to be an extreme value close to the size of the whole data set, then we're taking the distance of the test instance to all of the points in the data set and averaging those, which will probably give us something close to the baseline accuracy. I mean here, if I set k to be a ridiculous value like say 100, I'm going to take the 100 nearest instances and average their distance, average their classes, we get an accuracy of 35% which I think is pretty close to the baseline accuracy for this data set. Let me just uh, find that out with 0R. The baseline accuracy is indeed 35%. So nearest neighbor is a really good method. It's often very accurate. Uh, it can be slow, um, and simple implementation would involve scanning the entire training data set to make, e make each prediction, because we've got to calculate the distance of the unknown test instance from all of the training instances to see which is the closest. But there are more sophisticated data structures that can make this faster, so you don't need, don't need to scan the whole data set every time. It assumes all attributes are equally important. and. Uh, if that wasn't the case, you might want to look at schemes for selecting attributes or weighting attributes, depending on their importance. If we've got noisy instances, then we can use a majority vote over the k nearest neighbors, or we might weight instances according to their prediction accuracy. Or we might try and identify reliable prototypes, one for each of the classes. This is a very old method. Statisticians have used k nearest neighbors since the 1950s, and there's an interesting theoretical result that if the number of training instances approaches infinity and k also gets larger in such a way that uh, k over n becomes zero, but k also approaches infinity, the uh, error of uh, the k nearest neighbor method approaches a theoretical minimum error for that data set. So there's a theoretical guarantee that with a huge data set and large values of k, you're going to get good results from nearest neighbor learning. There's a section in the text, section 4.7 on instance-based learning. Uh, this is the last lesson of class 3. Off you go and do the activity, and I'll see you in class 4. And, and welcome to Data Mining with Weka back here in New Zealand. In this class, class 4, we're going to look at some pretty cool machine learning methods. Uh, we're going to look at linear regression, classification by regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, and ensemble learning. The last few of these are contemporary methods that haven't been around very long. They're kind of state-of-the-art machine learning methods. Remember, there's five classes in this course, so next week is class five, the last class, and we'll be kind of tidying things up and summarizing things then. So uh, you're well over halfway through, you're doing well, just hang on in there. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to start by looking at classification boundaries for different machine learning methods. We're going to use Weka's Boundary Visualizer, which is another Weka tool that we haven't encountered yet. I'm going to use a two-dimensional data set. I've prepared uh, iris.2d.arf just over, let me just open this up here. It's a two-dimensional version of the IRIS data set. I took the regular IRIS data set and deleted a couple of attributes, sepal length and sepal width, leaving me with this 2D data set and the class. And we're going to look at that using the boundary visualizer. And you get that from this visualization menu on the Weka chooser. There's a lot of tools. Uh, in Weka, so we're just going to look at this one here, the Boundary Visualizer. And I'm going to open the same file in the Boundary Visualizer, the two-dimensional iris data, iris.2d.arf. And here we've got a plot of the data. You can see we're plotting petal width on the y-axis against petal length on the x-axis. This is a picture of the data set with the three classes, Setosa in red, um, Verticolor in green, and Virginica in blue. I'm going to choose a classifier. Let's begin with the 1R classifier, which is in rules. I'm going to plot training data and just let it rip. And the color diagram here shows the decision boundaries with the training data superimposed on it. Let's look at what 1R does to this data set in the Explorer. 
we'll go to classify and choose 1R and uh, let it go. And 1R has chosen to split on petal width. If it's less than a certain amount, we get a setosa, intermediate, a versicolor, greater than the upper boundary, a virginica. And that's the same as what's being shown here. We're splitting on petal width, and if it's less than a certain amount, we get a setosa in the middle, a versicolor, and at the top, a virginica. This is a spatial representation of the decision boundary that 1R creates on this data set. And that's what the boundary visualizer does. It draws decision boundaries. It shows here that 1R chooses an attribute, in this case petal width, to split on. It might have chosen petal length, in which case we'd have vertical decision boundaries. But either way, we're going to get stripes from 1R. I'm going to go ahead and look at some boundaries for other schemes. Let's, let's look at IBK, which is a lazy classifier. That's the instance-based learner we looked at in the last class. And uh, I'm just going to uh, run that. And here we get a different kind of pattern. I'll just stop it there. We've got diagonal lines. So uh, down here are the setosas underneath this diagonal line, and the versicolors in the intermediate region, and the virginicas by and large in the top right-hand corner. I remember what 1R does. It takes a test instance. Let's say we had an instance here, just on this side of the boundary in the red. And uh, we then it chooses the nearest instance to that. Uh, that would be this one, I guess. That would be the nearest instance. That's kind of nearer than this one here. So this is a red point. But if I were to cross over the boundary here, it would choose a green point, because this the green class, because this would be the nearest instance then. So if you think about it, this boundary goes halfway between this uh, nearest red point and this nearest green point. Similarly, up here, if we take a point up here, I guess the two nearest instances are uh, this blue one and this green one, and uh, this blue one's closer. So in this, in this case, the boundary goes along this straight line here. Now I can see it's not just a single line, this is a piecewise linear line. So this part of the boundary goes exactly halfway between these two points, quite close to it. And down here, the boundary goes exactly halfway between these two points. It's the perpendicular bisector of the line joining these points. So we get a piecewise linear boundary made up of little pieces. Kind of interesting to see what happens if we change the parameter. We look at, say, five nearest neighbors instead of just one. And now we get a slightly blurry picture. I'll just stop it there. We get a blurry picture because whereas down here, say, in the pure red region, the five nearest neighbors to a point here are all red points. If you look into the intermediate region here, then the nearest neighbors to a point here, uh, you know, this is going to be in the five, and this might be another one of the five, and there might be a couple more down here in the five. So we get an intermediate color here. Uh, IBK takes a vote. So if we had three reds and two greens, then we'd sort of be in the red region, and that would be depicted as this kind of um, darker red here. If we had uh, the other way around, with more greens than reds, would be in the green region. So we get a kind of a blurring of these kind of boundaries. These are kind of a probabilistic description of the boundary. Let me just uh, change k to 20. See what happens. Now we get the same kind of shape, but with even more blurry sort of boundaries. The boundary visualizer reveals the way that machine learning schemes are thinking, if you like. They're kind of internal representation of the data set. And they kind of help you think about the sorts of things that machine learning methods do. Let's choose another scheme. I'm going to choose Naive Bayes here. Now, when we talked about Naive Bayes, we only talked about discrete attributes. With continuous attributes, well, I'm going to choose a supervised discretization method. Don't worry about this detail. It's uh, the most common way of using Naive Bayes with, uh, with numeric attributes. So uh, let's have a look at that kind of picture. This is kind of interesting, you know, when you think about Naive Bayes, it treats each of the two attributes 
as contributing equally and independently to the decision. So it sort of decides what it should be along this dimension and decides what it should be along this dimension and kind of multiplies the two together. Remember all that multiplication that went on in naive Bayes. So when you multiply these things together, you get a kind of a checkerboard pattern of probabilities, multiplying up the probabilities. That's because the attributes are being treated independently. That's a very different kind of decision binary from what we saw with instance-based learning. And that's what's so good about the binary visualizer. It helps you to kind of think about how things are working inside. I'm going to do one more example. I'm going to do uh, J48, which is in trees. Let me just uh, run this. And here we get this kind of structure. Let's take a look at what happens in the Explorer if we choose J48. Well, we get this little decision tree split first on petal width. If it's less than 0.6, it's a Satosa for sure. And then split again on petal width. If it's greater than 1.7, it's a Virginica for sure. And then in between, split on petal length and then again on petal width, getting a mixture of Verticolors and Virginicas. So we split first on petal width, that's this split here. Remember the vertical axis is the petal width axis. If it's less than a certain amount, it's a Satosa for sure. Then we split again on the same axis. If it's greater than a certain amount, it's a Virginica for sure. If it's in the intermediate region, we split on the other axis, that is petal length. And down here, it's a Verticolor for sure, and here we're going to split again on the petal width attribute. Let's just change the min num obj parameter controls the minimum size of the nodes, of, of the leaves. So if we increase that, we're going to get a simpler kind of tree. We discussed this parameter in one of the lessons of class three. So if we uh, run now, then we get a simpler version corresponding to the simpler rules we get with this parameter set. Or we could set the parameter to a higher value, say 10, and run it again, and we get even simpler rules, very similar to the rules produced by 1R. OK, so we've looked at classification boundaries. Classification classifiers create boundaries in instance space, and different classifiers have different capabilities for carving up instance space. That's called the bias of the classifier, the way in which it's capable of carving up the instance space. Uh, we looked at 1R, IBK, Naive Bayes, and J48, and found completely different biases, completely different ways they carve up the instance space. Now, of course, this kind of visualization is restricted to numeric attributes and two-dimensional plots. So it's not a very general tool, but it certainly helps you think about these different classifiers. You can now read about uh, classification boundaries in section 17.3 of the course text, and now off you go and do the activity associated with this lesson. Good luck. We'll see you later. This is lesson uh, 4.2 on linear regression. Back in Lesson 1.3, we actually mentioned the difference between a classification problem and a regression problem. A classification problem is when what you're trying to predict is a nominal value, whereas in a regression problem, what you're trying to predict is a numeric value. We've seen examples of data sets with nominal and numeric attributes before, but we've never looked at the problem of regression, of trying to predict a numeric value as the output of a machine learning scheme. So that's what we're doing in this class, linear regression. We've only had nominal classes so far, so now we're going to look at numeric classes. And this is a classical statistical method dating back uh, more than two centuries, I guess. Uh, and this is the kind of picture that you see. You've got a cloud of data points in two dimensions, and we're trying to fit a straight line to this cloud of data points, and we're looking at the best kind of straight line fit. Only in our case, we might have more than uh, two dimensions. There might be multiple dimensions. It's still a standard kind of problem. 
And uh, uh, let's just look at the two-dimensional case here. You can write a straight line equation in this form uh, with weights w0 plus w1a1 plus w2a2 and so on. Just think about this in one dimension where there's only one a. So forget about all the things at the end here. Just consider uh, w0 plus w1a1. That's the equation of this line. That's the equation of a straight line where w0 and w1 are two constants to be determined from the data. This, of course, is going to work most naturally with numeric attributes because we're kind of multiplying these attribute values by weights. Uh, we'll worry about nominal attributes in just a minute. So we're going to calculate these weights from the training data, W0, W1, and W2. Those are what we're going to calculate from the training data. And then once we've calculated the weights, we're going to predict the value for the first training instance, A1. The notation gets really horrendous here. I know it looks pretty scary, but it's pretty simple. We're just using this linear sum with these weights that we've calculated, using the attribute values of the first test instance here. Uh, and in order to get the predicted value for that. So we're going to look, we're going to get predicted values for the training instances using this rather horrendous looking formula here. I know it looks pretty scary, but it's actually not so scary. These W's are just numbers that we've calculated from the training data. And then uh, these things here are the attribute values of the first training instance, A1. That's the 1 at the top here, means it's the first training instance. This kind of 1, 2, 3 means it's the first, second, and third attribute. Can we, write this? we can write this in this neat little sum form here, which looks a little bit better. Notice, by the way, that we're defining A0, the zeroth attribute value, to be 1. That just makes this formula kind of work. Anyway, for the first training instance, you know, it might be this one here, that gives us this number x, you know, the predicted value for the first training instance of this particular value of uh, a1. And then what we're doing then, we're choosing the weights to minimize the squared error on the training data. So this is the actual x value for this ith training instance. This is the predicted value for the ith training instance. So we're going to take the difference between the actual and the predicted value, square them up, and add them all together. And that's what we're trying to minimize. So where we get these weights from is we get the weights by minimizing this sum of squared errors. That's a mathematical job that we don't need to worry about the mechanics of doing that. It's a standard matrix problem. Uh, it works fine if there are more instances than attributes. You couldn't expect this to work if you had a huge number of attributes and not very many instances. But uh, providing uh, there are more instances than attributes, and usually there are, of course, then it's going to work OK. If we did have nominal values, well, if we just had a two-value, a binary value, 0 and 1, we could just convert it to 0 and 1 and use those numbers. If we had a multi-valued nominal attribute, well, uh, you'll have a look at that in the activity at the end of this lesson. OK, let's do it then. We're going to open a regression uh, data set, cpu.arf. Now, this is a regular kind of data set. It's got numeric attributes. And the most important thing here is it's got a numeric class. We're trying to predict a numeric value. And we can uh, just go and run linear regression. It's in the functions category, functions linear regression. And uh, we just run it. And this is the output. We've got the model here. That's the class is being predicted as a linear sum. These are the weights I was talking about. So it's this weight times this attribute value plus this weight times this attribute value, and so on. Minus, and this is the w naught, the kind of uh, the weight that's uh, just a constant kind of weight, not modified by an attribute value. So this is a formula for computing the class. And when you use that formula, uh, you can look at the success of it in terms of the training data. The correlation coefficient, which is a standard statistical measure, uh, is 0.9. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and then there's various other error figures here that are printed. Uh, on the slide, you can see uh, the interpretation of these error figures. It's really hard to know which one to use. Uh, they all tend to produce the same sort of picture, uh, but I guess the exact one you should use uh, depends on the application. There's a mean absolute error, 
uh, the root mean squared error, which is kind of the standard metric to use, I guess. Okay, that's linear regression. Now I'm actually going to look at non-linear regression here. A model tree is a tree where each leaf has got one of these linear regression models. So we kind of create a tree like this, and then at each leaf we have a linear model which has got those coefficients. So it's kind of like a patchwork of linear models. And these kind of, this set of, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six linear patches approximate a continuous function. So there's a method under trees with a rather mysterious name of M5P. And if we just run that, that produces a model tree. Maybe I should just uh, visualize the tree here. And uh, now I can see the model tree. It's similar to the one on the screen, on the slide. Uh, and you can see that each of these, uh, in this case five uh, leaves, has got a linear model LM1, LM2, LM3. And if we look back here, the linear models are defined like this. LM1 has got a formula, this linear formula for LM1, this linear formula for LM2, and so on. So uh, we chose trees uh, M5P, we ran it and we looked at the output. We could compare the performance of this. These performance figures are 92, 93% correlation, a mean absolute error of uh, 30 and so on. We could uh, compare those with the ones for the regular linear regression, which has got a slightly lower correlation and a slightly higher absolute error. In fact, I think all of these error figures are slightly higher. That's something we'll be asking you to do in the activity associated with uh, this lesson. So linear regression is a well-founded, venerable mathematical technique. Uh, and, uh, but practical problems often require nonlinear solutions. So uh, M5P, the M5P method builds trees of regression models with regret linear models at each leaf of the tree. You can read about this in the course text in section uh, 4.6. And uh, off you go now and do the activity associated with this lesson. We'll see you soon. Hi, welcome back. In the last lesson, we looked at uh, linear regression, the problem of predicting not a nominal class value, but a numeric class value, the regression problem. And in this lesson, we're going to look at how to use regression techniques for classification sounds a little bit weird, but regression techniques can be really good under certain circumstances. And we're going to see if we can apply them to classific ordinary classification problems. So in a two-class problem, it's quite easy really. We're going to call the two classes 0 and 1, and just use those as numbers. And then come up with a regression line uh, that presumably for most 0 uh, instances has got a pretty low value, and for most one instances has got a larger value, and then come up with a threshold for determining whether if it's less than that threshold we're going to predict class 0, if it's greater we're going to predict class 1. If we want to generalize that to more than two classes, we can use a separate regression for each class. We set the output to 1 for instances that belong to the class, and 0 for instances that don't and then come up with a separate regression line for each class. And given an unknown test example, we're going to choose a class with the largest output. That would give us n uh, regressions for uh, an, a problem where there are n different classes. We could uh, alternatively use pairwise regression, take every pair of classes, that's n squared, n squared over 2, and uh, have a linear regression line for each pair of classes discriminating a class one of that pair from the other of that pair. Anyway, we're going to work with a two-class problem. And we're going to uh, just investigate two-class classification by regret. I'm going to open diabetes. And then I'm going to convert the class. Well, actually, let's just try and apply regression to this. I'm going to try the regression, linear regression. And you see it's grayed out here. That means it's not applicable. I can actually select it, but I can't start it. 
it's not applicable because linear regression applies to a data set where the class is numeric and we've got a data set where the class is nominal. So we need to fix that. We're going to change this from these two labels to 0 and 1 respectively. And we'll do that with a filter. We want to uh, change an attribute. It's unsupervised. And uh, uh, we want to change a nominal to a binary attribute, actually. That's a nominal to binary filter. And uh, we want to apply that to the ninth attribute. This will apply it to all of the attributes. It's going to apply it to the ninth attribute. And I'm hoping it will change this attribute from uh, nominal to binary. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It doesn't have any effect. And the reason it doesn't have any effect is these attribute filters don't work on the class value. So if I just to change it, I can change the class value here. So we're going to give this no class. So now this is not uh, the class value for the data set. Run the filter again. And now I've got what I want. This uh, attribute class is either 0 or 1. In fact, this is the histogram. There are this number of zeros and this number of uh, ones, which corresponds to the two different values in the original data set. Now we've got our linear regression, and uh, we can just uh, run it. And uh, this is the regression line. So it's a line. 0.02 times the pregnancy attribute, plus this times the class attribute, plus so on, plus this times the age attribute, plus this number. That will give us a number for any given instance. And we can see that number if we select Output Predictions and run it again. And uh, here's a table of predictions for each instance in the data set. This is the instance number. This is the actual class of the instance, which is 0 or 1. This is the predicted class, which is a number. Sometimes it's less than 0. And we would hope that these numbers are generally fairly small for zeros and generally larger for uh, ones. And they sort of are, although it's not really easy to tell. This is just the error value here in the fourth column. So I'm going to do a more extensive investigation here. And you might ask, why are we bothering to do this? First of all, it's an interesting idea that I want to explore. It will lead to quite good performance for classification by regression. And it will lead into the next lesson on logistic regression, which is an excellent uh, classification technique. And perhaps most importantly, we'll just learn how to do some cool things with the Weka interface. So my strategy is to add a new attribute, I'm going to call it classification, that gives this number here, this predicted number. And then we're going to use 1R to optimize a split point for the two classes. We'll have to restore the class back to its original nominal value, because remember, I just converted it to numeric. OK, so here it is in detail. We're going to uh, get a supervised, we're going to use a supervised attribute filter. This is actually pretty cool, I think. It's a supervised filter. It's an attribute filter. We're going to add a new attribute called classification. And we're going to choose a classifier for that. We're going to choose linear regression. That classifier, we need to set uh, output classification. And if we just run this, it'll add a new attribute to the data set. There it is. It's called classification. And it's got these numeric values, which correspond exactly to the numeric values that were predicted here by the linear regression uh, scheme. So now uh, we've got this classification attribute. And what I'd like to do now is to convert the class attribute back to nominal, because it's numeric. Because I want to use 0R now. And 0R will only work with a nominal class. So let me convert that. I want, um, I guess I want numeric to nominal. And I want to run that on attribute number 9. And uh, let me just uh, apply that. And now, uh, sure enough, I've got the two labels, right? The labels are 0 and 1. This is a nominal attribute with these two labels. I'm not sure to make that the class attribute. Where is it gone? 
for the data set, then I get the colors back, the two colors for the two classes. So really I want to predict this class based on the value of classification, that numeric value. So I'm going to delete all of the other attributes. And I'm going to go to my classify panel here. And uh, I'm going to predict class. We're going to predict this nominal value class. And I'm going to use 1R. That one there. And uh, I think I'll just stop outputting the predictions because they'll just get in the way. And run that. And here I have it, 72%, 73%. That's a bit disappointing. But actually, when you look at this, uh, one R has produced this really overfitted rule. We want a single split point. You know, if it's less than this, then predict zero. Otherwise, predict one. So we can get around that by changing this B parameter, the bucket size parameter, something much larger. I'm going to change it to 100 here and run it again. And now I've got much better performance, 77% uh, accuracy. And this is the kind of split I've got. If the classification, that is the regression value, is less than 0.47, I'm going to call it a 0. Otherwise, I'm going to call it a 1. So I've got what I wanted, classification by regression. We've extended linear regression to classification. This performance of 76.8% uh, is actually quite good for this problem. It was easy to do with two classes, 0 and 1. Otherwise, you need to have a regression for each, each class value, multi-response linear regression, or else each pair of class values, pairwise linear regression. And we learned quite a few things about Weka. We learned about uh, unsupervised attribute filters to convert nominal attributes to binary and numeric attributes back to nominal. We learned about this cool filter, add classification, which adds the classification according to a machine learning scheme as an attribute in the data set. We learned about setting and unsetting the uh, class of the data set. And we learned about the minimum bucket size parameter to prevent 1R from overfitting. So that's classification by regression. In the next lesson, we're going to do better. We're going to look at logistic regression, an advanced technique which effectively does classifying, classification by regression in an even more effective way. So we'll see you soon. Bye. Hi. Welcome back to Data Mining with Weka. In the last lesson, we looked at uh, classification by regression, how to use linear regression to perform classification tasks. And in this lesson, we're going to look at a more powerful uh, way of doing the same kind of thing. It's called logistic regression. It's fairly mathematical, and we're not, certainly not going to go into the dirty details of how it works. But I'd like just to give you a flavor of the kinds of uh, things it does and the basic principles that underlie logistic regression. And then, of course, you can use it yourself in Weka without any problem. One of the things about uh, data mining is that you can sometimes do better by using prediction probabilities rather than actual classes. Instead of predicting whether it's going to be a yes or a no, you might do better to predict the probability with which you think it's going to be a yes or a no. You know, the weather is 95% likely to be rainy tomorrow or 72% likely to be sunny. Instead of saying, oh, it's definitely going to be rainy or it's definitely going to be sunny. So probabilities are really useful things uh, in data mining. Uh, Naive Bayes produces probabilities. It works in terms of probabilities. We've uh, seen that in an earlier lesson. I've opened, I'm going to open Diabetes here and uh, just run Naive Bayes. Bayes. Naive Bayes. Uh, I'm going to use a percentage split. Out of 90%, so that leaves 10% uh, as a test set. And then I'm going to, sorry, 90%. And then I'm going to make sure I output the predictions on those 10% and run it. And what I get here, I want to look at the predictions that have been output. So this is a two class data set. The classes are tested negative and tested positive. And these are the instances, number one, number two, number three. This is the actual class, tested negative, tested positive, tested negative. This is the predicted class, 
tested positive, tested negative, tested negative. This is a plus under the error column to say where there's an error. So there's an error with instance number two. And these are the actual uh, probabilities that come out of naive Bayes. So for instance, one, we've got a 99% probability it's a negative and a 0.01, a 1% probability uh, it's a, a positive. So we predict it's going to be negative. That's why that's tested negative. And in fact, we're correct, it is tested negative. Uh, this instance, which is actually incorrect, we're predicting 67% uh, for negative and 33% for positive. So we decide it's a negative, tested negative, and we're wrong. You know, we might have been better saying, well, here we're really sure it's going to be a negative, and we're right. Here we think it's going to be a negative, but we're really not sure, and it turns out that we're wrong. Sometimes it's a lot better to think in terms of the output uh, as probabilities, rather than being forced to make a binary black or white classification. Other data mining methods produce probabilities as well. If I look at 0R and I run that, then these are the probabilities. Point 60, 65% versus 35%. Oh, and this is the same. Oh, and this is the same. And this is the same. Of course, it's 0R. It always produces the same thing. In this case, it always says tested negative, And it always has the same probabilities. And the reason why the numbers are like that, if you look at this slide here, is that we've chosen a 90% training set and a 10% test set. And the training set contains 448 negative instances and 243 positive instances. Remember the Laplace correction in Lesson 3.2? We add 1 to each of those counts to get 449 and 244. And that gives us a 65% probability of being a negative instance. So that's where these numbers come from. Or uh, if we look at uh, J48, trees, J48, and run that. Then we get more interesting probabilities here, the uh, negative and positive probabilities, respectively. And uh, you can see where the errors are. These probabilities are all different. Internally, J48 uses probabilities in order to do its pruning operations. We talked about that when we discussed J48's pruning, although we didn't talk exp I didn't explain explicitly how the probabilities are derived. Uh, so the idea of logistic regression is to make linear regression produce probabilities too. Now this gets a little bit hairy here. Remember, when we use linear regression for, for classification, we calculate a linear function using regression, and then we apply a threshold to decide whether it's a 0 or a 1. It's tempting to imagine that you can interpret these numbers as probabilities instead of thresholding them like that. But that's a mistake. They're not probabilities. These numbers that come out on the regression line, sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're greater than 1. They can't be probabilities because probabilities don't work like that. So in order to get better probability estimates, uh, a slightly more sophisticated technique uh, is used. So in linear regression, we have a linear sum. In logistic regression, we have a lin the same linear sum down here. This is the same kind of linear sum that we saw before. But we embed it in this kind of formula. This is called the logit transform. And the logit transform, this is multidimensional with uh, a lot of different a's here. We've got just one dimension, one variable, a1. Then if this is the input to the logit transform, then the output looks like this. It's between 0 and 1. It's sort of an S-shaped curve that applies a sort of a softer kind of function rather than just sort of 0 and then a step function. It's a soft version of a step function that never gets below 0, never gets above 1, and has a kind of smooth transition in between. And when you're working with a logit transform, instead of minimizing the squared error, remember when we do linear regression we minimize the squared error, it's uh, better to choose weights to maximize a different a probabilistic function called the log likelihood function, which is this pretty scary looking formula down at the bottom. So that's the basis of logistic regression. We won't talk about the details anymore. Let me just do it. We're going to use the diabetes data set. Uh, in the last lesson, we got 76.8% with classification by regression. 
Let me tell you, if you do 0R, naive bays, and J48, you get these numbers here. I'm going to find the logistic regression. It's a function it's called logistic. I'm going to use tenfold cross-validation. I'm not going to output the predictions. And I'll just run it. And I get 77.2% accuracy. That's the best figure in this column. It's not much better than naive Bayes. Uh, so you might be a bit skeptical about whether it really is better. So I actually did this 10 times and calculated the means myself. And we get these figures for the mean of 10 runs. Zero R stays the same, of course. It's 65.1%. It produces the same accuracy each run. But uh, naive Bayes, J48 are different. And here, logistic regression gets an average of 77.5, which is appreciably better than the other figures in this column. You can extend the idea to multiple classes. I mean, when we did this with uh, the, in the previous lesson, we performed a regression for each class, a multi-response re regression. But that actually doesn't work well with logistic regression, because you need the probabilities to sum to 1 over the various different classes. So that introduces more computational complexity and needs to be tackled as a joint optimization problem. So the result is logistic regression, a popular and powerful uh, machine learning method that uses the logit transform to predict probabilities directly. Works internally with probabilities like naive Bayes does. <clears throat> and we also learned in this lesson about prediction probabilities that can be obtained from other methods and how to calculate probabilities from zero R. You can read in the uh, course text about logistic regression in section 4.6. And now you should go and do the activity associated with this lesson. See you soon. Bye for now. Hello again. You know, in most courses, there comes a point where things start to get a little tough. In the last couple of lessons, you've seen some mathematics that you probably didn't want to see. And you might have realized that you'll never completely understand how all these machine le learning methods work in detail. Well, I want you to know that what I'm trying to convey is the gist of modern machine learning methods, not the details. What's important is that you can use them and that you understand a little bit of the principles behind how they work. And the math is almost finished. So hang on in there. Things will start to get easier. And anyway, there's not far to go, just a few more lessons. I told you before that I play music. Someone came around to my house last night with a contrabassoon. It's the deepest, lowest instrument in the orchestra. And you don't often see or hear one. So here I am trying to play a contrabassoon for the first time. <laughs> I think this has got to be the lowest point of our course, data mining with Weka. Now, today I want to talk about support vector machines, another advanced machine learning technique. Uh, we looked at logistic regression in the last lesson, and we find that uh, these produce linear boundaries in the space. In fact, here I've used Weka's boundary visualizer to show the boundary produced by a logic logistic regression machine. I think this is on the 2D R, the 2D iris data. Uh, yes, plotting pedal width against pedal length. So this kind of uh, black line is the boundary between two of these classes, the red class and the green class. Now, it, it might be more sensible if we were going to put a boundary between these two classes to try and kind of drive it through the widest channel between the two classes, the maximum separation from each class. So here's a picture where the black line now, the thick black line, is kind of right down the middle of the channel between the two classes. Actually, mathematically, we can uh, uh, find that line by taking the two critical members, one from each class. They're called support vectors. These are the critical members that define, the critical points that define the channel. And take the perpendicular bisector of the line joining those two support vectors. 
That's the kind of geometry. That's the idea of support vector machines. We're going to put a line between the two classes, but not just any old line that separates them. We're trying to drive the widest channel between the two classes. So here's another picture. We've got two clouds of points, and I've drawn a line around the outside of each cloud, the green cloud and the brown cloud. And it's clear that any interior points aren't going to affect this uh, hyperplane, this plane this line, separating line. I call it a line, but in multi-dimensions it would be a plane or a hyperplane in uh, four or more dimensions. And uh, there's just a few of the points in each cloud that define the position of the line, the support vectors. In this case, there's two points. So support vectors define the boundary. And the thing is that all of the other instances in the training data could be deleted without changing the position of the a dividing hyperplane. Uh, so there's an equation, a simple equation, and this is the last equation in this course, a simple equation uh, that uh, gives the formula for the maximum margin hyperplane as a sum over the support vectors. These are kind of a, a vector product uh, with each of the support vectors and uh, the sum there. So it's pretty simple to calculate this maximum margin hyperplane once you've got the support vectors. It's a very easy sum. And like I say, it only depends on the support vectors. None of the other points play any part in this calculation. Now in real life, you might not be able to drive a straight line between the classes. Classes are called linearly separable if there exists a straight line that separates the two classes. And in this picture, the two classes are not linearly separable. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but there are some blue points on the green side of the line and a couple of green points on the blue side of the line. And in fact, it's not possible to get a single line, a single straight line that uh, divides these points. And that makes support vectors and mach machines, it makes the mathematics a little bit more complicated. But it's still possible to define the maximum margin hyperplane under, under these conditions. So that's it. Support vector machines. It's a linear decision boundary. But actually, there's a really clever technique which allows you to get more complex boundaries. It's called the kernel trick. And uh, by using different formulas for the kernel, and in Weka you just select some from some possible different kernels, you can get different shapes of boundaries, not just straight lines. Support vectors uh, are fantastic. Support vector machines are fantastic because they're very resilient to overfitting. You see, the boundary just depends on a very few, a very small number of points in the data set. Uh, so it's not going to overfit the data set because it doesn't depend on almost all of the points in the data set. It's just a few of these critical points, the support vectors. So it's very resilient to overfitting, even with large numbers of attributes. In Weka, uh, there's a couple of implementations of support vector machines. We could look in the functions category for SMO. Let me have a look at that over here. Uh, if I look in functions for SMO, that implements an algorithm called sequential minimal optimization for training a support vector classifier. And there's a few parameters here, including, for example, the different choice of kernels. You can choose different kernels. You can kind of play around and try out different things. Uh, a few other parameters. Actually, the SMO algorithm is restricted to two classes, so this will only work with a two-class data set. Uh, there's are other more comprehensive implementations of support vector machines in Weka. There's a library called libsvm, an external library. And uh, Weka has an interface to this library. This is a wrapper class for the libsvm tools. You need to have, uh, you need to download these separately from Weka and put them in the right Java class path. And you can see there's a lot of uh, different parameters here, and in fact, a lot of information on, uh, on this uh, sequential, uh, in this support vector machine package. Okay, that's support vector machines. 
Uh, you can read about them in section 6.4 of the textbook if you like, and please go and do the associated activity. See you soon for the last lesson in this class. Bye. We're up to the last lesson in the fourth class, lesson 4.6 on ensemble learning. So, you know, in real life, when we have important decisions to make, we often choose to make them using a committee, having different experts sitting down together with different perspectives on the problem and letting them vote is often a very effective and robust way of making good decisions. Well, the same is true in machine learning. We can often improve predictive performance by having a bunch of different machine learning methods, all producing classifiers for the same problem, and then letting them vote when it comes to classifying an unknown test instance. One of the disadvantages is that this produces output that's hard to analyze. Now, there are actually approaches that try and produce a single comprehensible structure, but uh, we're not going to be looking at any of those, so the output will be hard to analyze, but you often get very good performance. A fairly recent technique in, uh, in uh, machine learning. Uh, so we're going to look at four methods. They're called bagging, randomization, boosting, and stacking. And they're all implemented in Weka, of course. So the idea with bagging, we want to produce several different decision structures. Let's say we use uh, J48 to produce decision trees. Then we want to produce slightly different decision trees. And we can do that by having several different training sets of the same size. And we can get those by sampling the original set, the original training set. In fact, uh, in bagging, you sample the set with replacement, which means that sometimes you might get two samples, two of the same samples uh, chosen in your sample. So uh, we produce several different training sets, and then we build a model for each one, let's say a decision tree, using the same machine learning scheme or using some other machine learning scheme. And then we combine the predictions of the different models by voting. Uh, or if it's a regression situation, then you would average the result, the numeric result, rather than voting on it. This is uh, very suitable for learning schemes that are called unstable. Unstable learning schemes are ones where a small change in the training data can make a big change in the model. So decision trees are a really good example of this. You can get a decision tree and just make a tiny little change in the training data and get a completely different kind of decision tree. Whereas with naive bays, if you think about how naive bays works, uh, little changes in the training set aren't going to make much difference to the result of naive bay. So that's a stable machine learning method. In Weka, uh, we get bagging classifiers. We're going to the meta set. Here I am in Weka. I'm going to choose meta bagging. Here it is. And uh, we can choose here the bag size. This is saying a bag size of 100%. So it's going to sample the training set to get another set the same size, but it's going to sample with replacement. So that means uh, we're going to get different sets of the same size each time we sample. But each set might contain repeats of the original training set. And here we choose which classifier we want to bag, and we can choose the number of bagging iterations here and a random number seed. That's the bagging method. The next one I want to talk about is random forests. So here, instead of randomizing the training data, we randomize the algorithm. And how you randomize the algorithm depends on what the algorithm is. So random forests are when you're using decision tree algorithms. And remember, when we talked about how J48 works, it has to select, it selects the best attribute for splitting on it each time. Well, you can randomize this procedure by not necessarily selecting the very best, but choosing a few of the best options and randomly picking amongst them. That gives you different trees every time. And generally, if you bag decision trees, if you randomize them and bag the result, you, uh, you get better performance. So in Weka, we can look on the tree classifiers. 
which are down here for random forests. There we go. And uh, again, that's got a bunch of parameters. The maximum depth of the trees produced, I think zero would be unlimited depth. The number of features we're going to use, so we might select, say, four features. Uh, the number of trees we're going to produce, so we select from the top four features, is what I mean here. Every time we decide on, uh, on the decision to put in the tree, we select that from among the best, the top four candidates, the number of trees and so on. Uh, that's random forests. Now here's another kind of algorithm, it's called boosting. And uh, it's iterative. New models are influenced by the performance of previously built models. So basically the idea is that you create a model and then you look at the instances that are misclassified by that model. These are the sort of hard instances to classify, the ones that get wrong. And you put extra weight on those in instances to make a training set for uh, producing the next model in the iteration. This kind of encourages a new model, the next model, to become an expert for instances that were misclassified by all of the earlier models. And you know, the intuitive justification for this is that in a real life committee, committee members should complement each other's expertise by focusing on different uh, aspects of the problem. Uh, in the end, to combine them, we'd use voting. Uh, but uh, we actually weight models according to their performance in boosting. And uh, there's a very good scheme called AdaBoost M1, which is in Weka, which is a standard and very good boosting implementation. It often produces excellent results. And uh, there's a few parameters to this as well, the number, typically, uh, in particular, the number of iterations. Okay, the final ensemble learning method is called stacking. And here we're going to have base learners, just like the learners we talked about previously, but we're going to combine them not with voting, but by using a meta learner, another learner scheme that combines the output of the base learners. So we're going to call the base learners level zero models, and the meta learner is a level one model. The prediction of the base learners are input to the meta learner. Typically, you use different machine learning schemes as the base learners to get you know, different experts that are good at different things. And then you need to be a little bit careful in the way that you generate data to train the level one model. This involves quite a lot of cross-validation. I won't go into that. In Weka, there's a meta classifier called stacking. Stacking and stacking C, which is a more efficient version of stacking. Uh, so here's stacking, and uh, you can choose uh, different meta classifiers here, and, uh, and uh, the number of uh, stacking folds. You can choose different classifiers, different level zero classifiers, and a different meta classifier. Uh, in order to create multiple level zero models, you need to specify a meta classifier as the level zero model. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated. You need to fiddle around with Weka to get that working. Okay, that's it then. So we've been talking about combining multiple models into ensemblers to produce an ensembler learning, and the analogy is with committees of humans. Diversity helps, especially when learners are unstable. And we can create diversity in different ways. In bagging, we create diversity by resampling the training set. In random forests, we create diversity by taking, choosing alternative branches to put in our decision trees. In boosting, we create diversity by focusing on where the existing model makes errors. And in stacking, we combine results from a bunch of different kinds of learners using another learner instead of just voting. Now, there's a chapter in the course text on uh, ensemble learning. It's quite a large topic, really. And uh, there's an activity that you should go and do before we proceed to the next class, the last class in this course. And we'll learn about putting it all together, taking a more global view of the machine learning process. We'll see you there. Hello again. This is the last class of data mining with Weka. 
And uh, we're going to kind of step back a little bit and take a look at some more global issues with regard to the data mining process. It's a short class with just four lessons on the data mining process. The next lesson is pitfalls and pratfalls. And there's data mining and ethics. And finally, a quick summary. So let's get on with lesson 5.1. This might be your vision of the data mining process. You got some data, or someone gives you some data. You got Weka. You apply Weka to the data, and you get some kind of cool result from that, and everyone's happy. Well, if so, I've got bad news for you. It's not going to be like that at all. Really, this would be a better way to think about this. You can have a circle, you're going to go round and round the circle. And it's true that Weka is important. It's in the very middle of the circle here. It's going to be crucial, but it's only a small part of what you have to do. So the, perhaps the biggest problem is going to be to ask the right kind of question. You need to be answering a question, not just vaguely exploring a collection of data. Then you need to get together the data the uh, data that you can get a hold of that gives you a chance of answering this question using data mining techniques. It's hard to collect the data. You're probably going to have an initial data set, but you might need to add to that some demographic data or some weather data or some data about other stuff. You know, you're going to have to go to the web and find uh, more information to augment your data set, then kind of merge that together, do some database hacking to get a, a data set that contains uh, all of the attributes that you think you might need, or that you think Weka might need. Then you're going to clean the data. The bad news is that real world data is always very messy. And that's a long and painstaking process of looking around, looking at the data, trying to understand it, trying to figure out what the anomalies are and whether it's good to delete them or not. You know, that's, that's going to take a while. Then you're going to need to define some new features, probably. This is the feature engineering process, and it's the key to successful data mining. And then finally, once you've then you're going to use Weka, of course, you might go around this circle a few times to get out a nice uh, algorithm for classification. And then you're going to need to deploy the algorithm in the real world. So each of these processes is difficult, you know. You need to think about the question that you want to answer. Tell me something cool about this data is not a good enough question. You need to know what you want to know from the data. Then you need to gather it. And there's a lot of data around, like I said at the very beginning. But the trouble is that we need classified data to use uh, classification techniques in data mining. So we need expert judgments on the data, expert classifications. And there's not so much, not so much data around with expert classifications or correct results. Uh, they say that more data beats a clever algorithm. So rather than spending time trying to optimize the exact algorithm you're going to use in Weka, you might be better off employed in getting more and more data uh, in. Then you've got to clean it. And like I said before, real data is very mucky. And, and that's going to be a painstaking matter of looking through it and looking for anom anomalies. Feature engineering, the next step, is the key to data mining. And we'll talk about how Weka can help you uh, a little bit in a minute. And then you've got to deploy the result. Implementing it, well, that's the easy part. The difficult part is to convince your bo boss to use this result from the, this data mining process that he probably uh, finds very mysterious and perhaps doesn't trust very much. So getting anything actually deployed in the real world is a pretty tough call, actually. The key technical part of all this is uh, feature engineering. And Weka has got a lot of features that will help with this. This is just a few of them. So it might be worthwhile defining a new feature, a new attribute that's a mathematical expression of an involving existing attributes. Or you might want to modify an existing attribute. So with add expression, you can use any kind of mathematical formula to create a new attribute from existing ones. You might want to normalize or center your data or standardize it statistically, transform a numeric attribute to have a zero mean. That's center. 
or transform it into a given numeric range, that's normalized, or to give it a zero mean and unit variance, that's a statistical uh, operation called standardization. You might want to take those uh, n uh, numeric attributes and discretize them into nominal values, and Weka has got both supervised and unsupervised attribute discretization filters. There's a lot of other transformations. For example, principal components transformation involves a matrix analysis of the data to select the principal components in a linear space. That's quite mathematical, and Weka contains a good implementation of that. Remove useless will remove attributes that don't vary at all or vary too much. Actually, I think we encountered that in, the, in one of our activities. And then there are a couple of, uh, of filters that help you deal with time series when your instances represent a series over time. You probably want to take the difference between one instance and the next, or a difference with some kind of lag, one instance and, and, and uh, the one five before it, or ten before it, and so on. So these are just a few of the filters that Weka contains to help you with your feature engineering. So the message of this lesson is that Weka is on only a small part of the entire data mining process, and it's the easiest part. So in this course, we've chosen to tell you about the easiest part of the process. I'm sorry about that. The other bits are, in practice, much more difficult. There's an old programmer's blessing. May all your problems be technical ones. Because it's the other problems, the political problems in getting a hold of the data and deploying the result, those are the ones that tend to be uh, much more onerous in the overall data mining process. So good luck. Uh, there's uh, some stuff about this in the course text. Section 1.3 contains information on fielded applications, all of which have gone through this kind of process in order to get them to be actually out there and used in the field. So there's an activity associated with this uh, lesson. Off you go and do it, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now. Hi. Welcome back for another few minutes in New Zealand. In the last lesson, lesson 5.1, uh, we learned that Weka only helps you with a small part of the overall data mining process, the technical part, which is perhaps the easy part. And in this lesson, we're going to learn that there are many pitfalls and pratfalls uh, even in that part. So let me just define for you a pitfall is a hidden or unsuspected danger or difficulty. And there are plenty of those in the field of machine learning. And a pratfall is a stupid and humiliating action, which it's very easy to do when you're working with data. So the first lesson is that you should be skeptical. In data mining, it's very easy to cheat. Whether you're cheating consciously or unconsciously, it's easy to mislead yourself or mislead others about the significance of your results. For a reliable test, you should use a completely fresh sample of data that has never been seen before. You should save something for the very end that you don't use until you've selected your algorithm, you've decide, decided how you're going to apply it and the filters and so on. Then at the very, very end, having done all that, run it on some fresh data to get an estimate of how it will perform. And don't be tempted to then change it to improve it so that you get better results on that data. Always do your final run on fresh data. I mean, we've talked a lot about overfitting, and this is basically the same kind of problem. Of course, you know not to test on the training set. Uh, we've talked about that endlessly throughout this course. Data that's been used for development in any way is tainted. Any time you use some data to help you make a choice of the filter or the classifier or how you're going to treat your your problem, then that data is, is kind of tainted. You should be using completely fresh data to get evaluation results. Leave some evaluation data aside for the very end of the process. And that's the first piece of advice. Another thing I haven't told you about in this uh, course so far is missing values. In real data sets, it's very common that some of the uh, data values are missing. They haven't been recorded. They might be unknown. They might, we might have forgotten to record them. They might be irrelevant. And uh, there are two basic strategies for dealing with missing values in a data set. You can omit instances where the attribute value is missing, 
or somehow find a way of omitting that particular attribute in that instance. Or you can treat missing as a separate possible value. So you need to ask yourself, is there significance in the fact that the value is missing? You know, they say if you get something wrong with you and go to the doctor and he does some tests on you, if you just record the tests that he does, not the results of the tests, but just the ones he chooses to do, then there's a very good chance you can work out what's wrong with you, just from the existence of the tests, not from their results. That's because the doctor chooses tests intelligently. The fact that he doesn't choose a test doesn't mean that that value is kind of missing or accidentally not there. There's huge significance in the fact that he's chosen not to do certain tests. So this is a situation where missing should be treated as a separate possible value. There's significance in the value, the fact that a value is missing. But in other situations, a value might be missing simply because a piece of equipment malfunctioned or for some other reason someone forgot something. And then there's no significance uh, in, uh, in the fact that it's missing. So pretty well all machine learning algorithms deal with missing values. In an ARF file, if you put a question mark as a data value, that's treated as a missing value. And uh, all, machine, all methods in Weka can deal with missing values. But they make different assumptions about them. So if you don't appreciate this, then it's easy to get misled. So let me just uh, take two simple and well-known to us examples, 1R and J48. They deal with missing values in different ways. I'm going to load the nominal weather data. and Let me just run 1R on it to get 42.8, 43%. Let me run J48 on it to get 50% at the top here. Now I'm going to just edit this data set. I'm going to change the outlook, the value of outlook. For the first four no instances, I'm going to change this value to missing. That's how we do it here in this editor. If we were to write this file out in ARF format, we would find that these four values were written in as question marks. So now if we look at outlook, which we are doing, you can see that it says here there are four missing values. And if you count up these labels, two, four, and four, that's uh, ten, 10 labels. So another four to make the 14 instances are missing. All right, let's go back to J48 and run it again. And we still get 50%, the same kind of result. Of course, this is a tiny data set. But the fact is that it's unaffected. The results here are unaffected by the fact that a few of the values are missing. However, if we run 1R, I get a much higher accuracy, 93% accuracy. 93%. And the rule that I've got is branch on Outlook, which is what we had before, I think. And here it's saying there's four possibilities. If it's sunny, it's a yes. If it's overcast, it's a yes. If it's rainy, it's a yes. And if it's missing, it's a no. So here, 1R is using the fact that a value is missing as significant, as something you can branch on. Whereas if you were to look at a J48 tree, it would never branch on. It would never have a branch that corresponded to a missing value. So it treats them differently. That's uh, very important to know and remember. And the final thing I want to tell you about in this lesson is the no free lunch theorem. There's no free lunch in data mining. So here's a way to illustrate it. Supposing you've got a two-class problem with 100 binary attributes. And let's say you've got a huge training set with a million instances in their classifications in the training set. So the number of possible uh, instances is 2 to the 100 there are 100 binary attributes. And you know 10 to the 6 of them. So you don't know the classes of 2 to the 100 minus 10 to the 6 examples. Now let me tell you that 2 to the 100 minus 10 to the 6 is as near as down at 2 to the 100. It's 99.999% of 2 to the 100. So there's a huge number of examples you just don't know the classes of. How could you possibly figure them out? If you apply a data mining scheme to this, it will figure them out. But how can you possibly figure out all of those 
uh, things just from the tiny amount of data that you've been given. In order to generalize, every learner must embody some knowledge or assumptions beyond the data it's given. And each learning algorithm implicitly provides a set of assumptions. The best way to think about those assumptions is to think back to the boundary visualizer we looked at in lesson 4.1. You saw that different machine learning schemes are capable of drawing different kind of boundaries in instance space. And these boundaries correspond to a set of assumptions about the sorts of, of decisions that we can make. So there is no universal best algorithm. There's no free lunch. There's no single best algorithm. Data mining is an experimental science, and that's why we've been teaching you how to experiment with data mining yourself. So this is just a summary. Uh, be skeptical. Uh, when people tell you about data mining results, they say there's this kind of accuracy, then to be sure about that, you want to have them test their classifier on your new, fresh data that they've never seen before. Overfitting has many faces. Different learning schemes make different assumptions about missing values, which can really change the result. There is no universal best learning algorithm. Data mining is an experimental science, and it's very easy to be misled by people quoting the results of data mining experiments. Okay, that's it for now. Off you go and do the, the activity, and uh, we'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson 5.3 of data mining with Weka. Before we start, I just uh, thought I'd show you where I live. I told you before I moved to Hamilton many years ago, moved to New Zealand many years ago. I live in a place called Hamilton. Let me just uh, zoom in and uh, see if we can find Hamilton in the North Island of New Zealand, kind of round about the centre of the North Island. This is where the University of Waikato is. And uh, here's the university. This is where I live. This is my journey to work. I cycle to work every morning through the countryside. As you can see, it's really nice. I kind of live out here in the country. I'm a sheep farmer. I got uh, four sheep. I got uh, three in the paddock and one in the freezer. Anyway, I cycle in. It takes me about half an hour and I get to the university. You know, I have the distinction of uh, being able to go from one, one week to the next without ever seeing a traffic light because I live out on the same edge of town as the university. And when I get to the campus of the University of Waikato, it's a very beautiful campus. We've got three lakes. There's two of the lakes and uh, another lake down here. It's just a really, really nice place to work. So I'm very happy here. Anyway, let's uh, move on to talk about data mining and ethics. In Europe, they have uh, a lot of pretty stringent laws about information privacy. For example, if you're going to collect any personal information about anyone, a purpose must be stated for that. The information should not be disclosed to others without consent. Records kept on individuals must be accurate and up-to-date. People should be able to review data about themselves. Data should be deleted when it's no longer needed. Personal information must not be transmitted to other locations. And some data is too sensitive to be collected except in extreme circumstances. This is true in uh, some countries in Europe, particularly Scandinavia, not true, of course, in the United States. So uh, data mining is about collecting and utilizing recorded information, and it's good to be aware of some of these ethical issues. People often try to anonymize data so that it's safe to distribute it for other people to work on, but anonymization is much harder than you think. Here's a little story for you when Massachusetts released medical records summarizing every state employee's hospital record in the mid-1990s, the governor gave a public assurance that it had been anonymized by removing all identifying information – name, address, social security number. He was surprised to receive his own health records, which included a lot of private information in the mail shortly afterwards. People could be re-identified from the information that was left there. There's uh, been quite a bit of uh, research done on re-identification techniques. For example, using publicly available records on the Internet, 50% of Americans can be identified from their city, birth date, and sex. And 85% can be identified, 85 can be identified if you include their zip code as well. 
There was an interesting, uh, some interesting work done on a movie database. Netflix released a movie, a, a database of a hundred million records of movie ratings. They got individuals to rate movies one to five, and they had a whole bunch of uh, people doing this. A total of a hundred million records. And it turned out that you could identify 99% of people in the database if you knew their rating, ratings for six movies and approximately when they saw them. Even if you only know their ratings for two movies, you can identify 70% of people. So this means you can use the database to find out the other movies that these people watched. They might not want you to know that. Re-identification is remarkably powerful and it is incredibly hard to anonymize data effectively in a way that doesn't destroy the value of the entire data set for mining purposes. Now, of course, the purpose of data mining is to discriminate. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn rules that discriminate one class from another in the data. Who gets the loan? Who gets a special offer? But, of course, certain kinds of discrimination are unethical, not to mention illegal. For example, racial and sexual, religious discrimination is certainly unethical and in most places illegal. But, you know, it depends on the context. So sexual discrimination is usually illegal. Except for doctors. Doctors are expected to take gender into account when they make their diagnoses. They don't want to tell a man that uh, he's pregnant, for example. And also, information that appears innocuous may not be. For example, area codes, zip codes in the United States correlate strongly with race. Membership of certain organizations correlates with gender. So although you might have removed the explicit racial and gender information from your database, it still might be able to be inferred from other information that's there. It's very hard to deal with data. It has a way of revealing secrets about itself in unintended ways. Another ethical issue concerning data mining is that correlation does not imply causation. So here's a classic example. As ice cream sales increase, so does the rate of drownings. Therefore, ice cream consumption causes drowning? Probably not. They're probably both caused by warmer temperatures, people going to beaches. And what data mining reveals is simply correlations, not causation. I mean, really, we want causation. We want to be able to predict the effects of our actions. But all we can look at using data mining techniques is correlation. To understand about causation, you need a, a, a deeper model of what's going on. So I just wanted to alert you to some of the issues, some of the ethical issues in data mining before you go away and use what you've learned in this course on your own data sets. Issues about the privacy of personal information, the fact that anonymization is harder than you think, re-identification of individuals from supposedly anonymized data is easier than you think, uh, data mining and discrimination, it is after all about discrimination, and the fact that correlation does not imply causation. There's a section in the textbook uh, data mining and ethics, which you could read for more background information, and there's a little activity associated with this lesson that you go and do. You should go and do now. I'll see you in the next lesson, which is the last lesson of the course. Bye for now. Hi, this is the last lesson in the course data mining with Weka, lesson 5.4 summary. So we'll just uh, have a just a quick summary of uh, what we learned here. So one of the main points I've been trying to convey is that there's no magic in data mining. There's a huge array of alternative techniques, and they're all fairly straightforward algorithms. We've seen the principles of many of them. Perhaps we don't understand the details, but we've got the basic idea of the main methods of uh, machine learning used in data mining. And there is no single universal best method. Data mining is an experimental science. You need to find out what works best on your problem. Weka makes it easy for you. Using Weka, you can try out different methods. You can try out different filters, different learning methods. 
You can play around with different data sets. It's very easy to do experiments on work out. Perhaps you might say it's too easy because it's important to understand what you're doing, not just blindly click around and uh, look at the results. And that's what uh, I've tried to emphasize in this course, understanding what you're doing and evaluating what you're doing. There are many pitfalls that you can fall into if you don't really understand what's going on behind the scenes. It's not a matter of just blindly applying the tools in the workbench. And uh, we've stressed in the course uh, a focus on evaluation, evaluating what you're doing and the significance of the results of the evaluation. Different algorithms differ in performance, as we've seen. But you know, in many problems, it's not a big deal. It's the differences between the algorithms are really not very important in many situations. And you should perhaps be spending more time on looking at the features and how the, how the problem is described and the kind of operational context that you're working in, rather than stressing about just getting the absolute best algorithm. It might not make all that much difference in practice. Use your time wisely. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we've missed out. I'm really sorry I haven't been able to cover more of this stuff. There's a whole uh, technology of filtered classifiers where you want to filter the training data but not the test data. That's especially true when you've got a supervised filter where the uh, results of the filter uh, depend on the class values of the training instances. You want to filter the training data but not the test data or maybe f uh, take a filter designed for the training data and apply the same filter for, to the test data without re-optimizing it for the test data, which would be cheating. And uh, you often want to do this during cross-validation, and the trouble in Weka is that you can't get a hold of those cross-validation folds. It's all done internally. So filtered classifiers are a simple way of dealing with this problem. We haven't talked about costs of different decisions and different kinds of errors, but in real life, different errors have got different costs. And uh, we've talked about uh, optimizing the error rate or the uh, classification accuracy, but really in most situations we should be talking about costs, not raw accuracy figures. And these are kind of different things. There's a whole panel on uh, the Weka Explorer for attribute selection, which helps you select a subset of attributes to use when learning. And in many situations it's really valuable to uh, before you do any learning to select an appropriate small subset of attributes to use. Uh, there are a lot of clustering techniques in Weka. Clustering is where you want to learn something even when there's no class value. You want to kind of cluster the instances according to their attribute values. And association rules, that's another kind of learning technique where we're looking for associations between attributes. There's no particular class, but we're looking for any strong associations between any of the attributes. Again, that's another panel in the Explorer. Text classification. There are some fantastic uh, text filters uh, in Weka, which allow you to handle textual data as words or as characters, n-gram sequences of three, four, or five consecutive characters. And you can do text mining using Weka. And then finally, we've focused uh, exclusively on the Weka Explorer. But uh, the Weka Experimenter is also worth getting to know you know, we've done a, a fair amount of rather boring, tedious calculations of means and standard deviations uh, manually by changing the random number seed and keep running things again. That's very tedious to do that by hand. The experimenter makes it very easy to do this automatically. So there's a lot more to learn. And I'm kind of wondering if uh, you'd be interested in an advanced data mining with Weka course. I'm toying with the idea of putting one on. I'd like you to let us know what you think about that idea and what you'd like to see included. So let me just finish off here with a kind of a final thought. You know, we've been talking about data, data mining. Data is recorded facts, a change of state in the world, perhaps. And that's the input to our data mining process, and the output is information, the patterns, the expectations that underlie that data, patterns that can be used for prediction and uh, have uh, useful applications in the real world. So we've been going from data really to information. 
moving up in the world of people, not computers. Knowledge is kind of the accumulation of your entire set of expectations, all the information that you have and how it works together. A large store of expectations and uh, different situations where they apply. And then finally, I'd like to define wisdom as the value attached to knowledge. I'd like to encourage you to be wise when using data mining technology. You've learned a lot in this course. You've got a lot of power now that uh, you can use to analyze your own data sets. Use it wisely. Use this technology wisely for the good of the world. And that's my final thought for you. Now there is an activity associated with this lesson, uh, a little revision activity, go and do that, and uh, then uh, do the assessment, the final assessment, and we will send you your certificate, if you do well enough. Good luck, and uh, it's been good talking to you, and maybe we'll see you in an advanced version of this course. Bye for now.